Good evening. Today is Wednesday, November 30th, and a special board meeting of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools is called to order. Um, first, we'll take attendance. Um, our first vice chair, Director Inojos Pressi, will be absent today. Um, I believe everybody else is present, and welcome to our brand new board member, Robert Salazar, to your first full meeting. Um, Next, we'll do our land acknowledgement. We are gathered today on the land of the Kalapuya, who are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. The relationship between the Kalapuya people and this land continues unbroken to this day, and we offer gratitude for the land and for the generations present and past who have stewarded the land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future Native American and in Indigenous students and staff of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. We invite you to join us in honoring these ancestral grounds and celebrating the resilience and strength of all Native American and Indigenous people. Okay, next, um, oh, I, you know what, I, I failed to mention, oh, nope, Director Guzman Ortiz is here. I know she was running a tiny bit late, so I just wanna make sure attendance was clear. Um, next is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Okay. Um, I do not think there are any agenda modifications this evening. Um, and so we will now move forward to number two on our agenda, which is the overview of the superintendent hiring process okay. and profile. Um, and we are joined tonight by Hank Harris and Kathleen um, Rodden Nord. Um, and right now I'll just turn it over to Hank to lead us through. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And hello, board. Uh, I'm good to be with you this evening. Um, so with respect to the overview of the super and higher tenant hiring process, we're at, a, we're at an exciting moment in the process. We're moving from uh, the initial phase, which we call the engagement phase, into the recruitment phase, which is kind of how it sounds. It's the recruitment. And so let me sort of talk a little bit about where we've been and where we are tonight and then what happens next. So over the last uh, several weeks, couple of months, in fact, we have um, gotten to know your community and your school district as deeply as well as we possibly could. Kathleen, my partner here, uh, was our engagement lead uh, and met with um, well over 100 um, community stakeholders. And by, when I use the word stakeholder, I wanna be clear, I mean anybody who has any investment in the school district, whether that is a, a parent, a community member, a staff person, a student, most importantly. Um, beyond that, we reached out um, through other means uh, and engaged with well over well over a thousand. I think I think our our last calculation was over thirteen hundred um, individuals informed that engagement process. So some of them engaged directly with myself or Kathleen. Some of them engaged directly with our community liaisons, your community liaisons, I should say. Some uh, many many engaged through the online survey, and we learned a lot about where Salem Kaiser is at this moment in time. And we asked in all of those forums, we focused really on three questions. We focused on what is going really well in the school district? What are people proud of? That's the first question. We asked that in various ways, but it's really getting to the heart of what is great about the Salem-Kaiser School District. And the next question that we moved to is what will the new superintendent face when they join your community, your school district uh, in July of 2023? What are the challenges? Um, Every school district has them. What are the challenges in Salem-Kaiser? What will be, this is all versions of that same question. What will be in their proverbial inbox that they will need to attend to on day one or day 100 
or year one or year two or year, year three. So that's the, what I often call that, what's the complexities? So we started with what's great, we moved to what's complexity, what are the complexities? And the third question we ask, and we ask this to people who are not sitting on the school board, we say, if you were sitting on the school board, what would you be looking for in terms of the profile of a candidate, in terms of the qualities and characteristics and experiences that person brings? And when we, when we sort of try to explain what we mean by that, I will often say, you know, we're looking for the professional experiences are what you would see in a resume and the qualities or attributes or the thing, are the things that you would encounter as you got to work with this person. So we want both. What are those qualities, characteristics, experiences, maybe three things. That's the third question. Let me just quickly repeat them again, because that's a salient for the work that we're doing tonight. What's great? What are the challenges? And what are the qualities that people would want the school board to be facing on? Tonight, we're going to focus uh, on a document that speaks to that third question. What are the qualities and characteristics? We're going to get to that just in a moment, um, because that's what you're going to take action on tonight, board. But I want to first speak to those first two questions. What's great? And what are the complexities? And I want to tell you kind of what we learned from engaging with 1,300 folks. Uh, as you can imagine, 1,300 individuals have a variety of um, things that they are proud of, that they see as challenges. Everybody comes at it with a different lens. Um, and we, so we spent a considerable amount of time engaging and then a considerable amount of time analyzing and making sense of all that input we had. And so I want to speak to um, five or six of kind of the, the, the strengths and challenges that, that rose to the top. As the people say, these are, when we look at the collective wisdom of your community, what did we learn? I believe there's a slide to that effect. Uh, and I don't know if I will see the slide as I'm going through this or how that works, Chair. Will, will we see that on the screen or should I just assume it's there in, in public space? Um, usually someone will pull it up on the screen. Um, okay. Do you so want, Christy, do you want me to do yeah. that? Let me Let me go find it quick. It's in the supplemental. Okay. Did I, I might be jumping ahead, Superintendent Perry. Am I, because I'm looking at that as maybe item number four below? No, this is the one that you did, you did an overview of the strengths yeah. and challenges. Is that the one you're looking for right now? Where, yep. I know, I don't want Let to me look concerned, real but yep. Do you want me to start talking about the first one while you're looking? Okay, I can do that. So, um, so the first strength that was, um, uh, and these are not necessarily in exact order, but um, there is some there is some sequence to the uh, prolificness of kind of what we heard. Um, the first strength I want to speak to is the incredible diversity of Salem Kaiser. This is seen as a great strength. Uh, 40,000 students, 58%, 58% 58 of them identifying as ethnically, racially, or linguistically diverse. Just gonna pause. I think it's a bullet point sheet that starts with at least my version. I think it's a document that is called Salem Kaiser Public Schools Engagement. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask Alice for it. She'll know exactly where it is. She will. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'll I'll just say a little bit more about the, the the diversity and and the source of pride that the community has um, around this um, in nearly every engagement group. Um, and many survey respondents spoke to this as being something that was deep and rich and valuable uh, and, and fostered a greater understanding and enjoyment of different cultures. Um, this diversity extends to broader communities and respondents noted connections created by sharing of traditions, music, art, languages, food, um, cultures. 
Um, and also the diversity around linguistically diverse members of the community, LB, LGBTQ plus and BIPOC students described feeling seen and heard by district leadership and board. Um, Hank, is it called engagement findings? The I, believe, I believe so. Okay, I can share it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm right. sorry, it's like my whole version of Word, but at least. Yeah, that looks great. Can see it, okay. <laughs> uh, so as you see, so we're gonna walk through um, six strengths. Um, and the next one I wanna speak about is the abundant programs and services uh, to support student needs. And we heard a lot of, um, and you know, this is sometimes a very complex area, but I would also say in other districts, um, we are, we sometimes hear more of that, this not being a strength than another district because it's, it's, a, it's a complex arena. Um, and that's not to say we didn't hear any concerns or frustrations, but in general, uh, the community uh, saw this as a, a strength and a source of pride. Um, MTSS and after school tutoring and migrant ed programs and the unified program and the ELL programs and the newcomer center and the community school outreach co coordinators. Um, there's a lot to be proud of in Salem Kaiser and a clearly uh, Not only source of pride, but certainly something that folks want their new superintendent to attend to and make sure is ably stewarded and perhaps enhanced, but certainly a, a recognition of this being a real, a real strong suit of Salem Kaiser. Uh, a lot of talk about how great the dual language program is and an excitement around that and um, the growth of it and the expansion of it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, many districts have, have begun the DLI journey. Um, Salem Kaiser has done from all accounts a remarkable job and has a commitment to continuing it. And we heard a lot of accolades about dual language. Uh, and we heard a lot of accolades in those, uh, in those next two areas, but they really need to be called out. So um, our, the fourth bullet point in terms of the strength of the district is uh, both your AVID and CTE programs. Um, we learned that there are that, that uh, Salem Kaiser is the only district in the Pacific Northwest um, with three AVID national demonstration schools. Um, some really, I want to just share actually an anecdotal story if I can that Kathleen was telling me that she, uh, she was talking to some of her former colleagues who uh, spent the day at McNary for AVID demonstration day and were, were totally blown away um, by the quality of, of what they're seeing, uh, the, the richness of the instruction. And I believe 95% of AVID scholars uh, go on to graduate. Um, so, so kudos, um, but it is, it is well seen and, and, and understood to be a, a great strength of the district. Uh, CTE also, um, people are incredibly proud of it around that um, with a long list of uh, CTE programs. Um, and some of them are, are CT programs you don't see in a whole lot of places. Uh, drone technology, robotics, uh, cosmetology, cabinet making. Um, some really, really good things. In the fifth bullet point, the nurturing the whole child through the arts. Um, I was, I was particularly um, excited and interested to hear where, where this landed because as a, as a lifelong, well, I should say as a, as a, maybe not lifelong, but my adult life was in Oregon as an educator. And I always heard, uh, I always heard people talk about the arts in Salem Kaiser. So I wasn't surprised, and particularly music. Um, I remember being an HR director, uh, you know, when everybody was cutting music and Salem Kaiser managed to uh, maintain and expand theirs. And uh, folks in the community have, have said um, over and over that the valuing of arts serves um, as a connection point um, between the districts at schools and the broader community. It's a source of pride, um, longstanding commitment to musical education, but it's not limited to music um, and the performing arts, the visual arts as well. Uh, were often stated as, um, as a great strength of the district. And uh, the sixth bullet point is about, is about the staff and about their commitment to the kids of Salem-Kaiser. Um, we hear that staff really cares, um, really cares deeply. And that, that's an important thing. And it's maybe not a, you know, we would want to make sure that our teachers are looking out for our students, but we heard, heard um, 
we heard from a lot from our students in particular how cared for they were by staff and all staff and not just let's say um let's say the ones that they are immediately around but um licensed staff um classified staff administrators and being known and being feeling cared for and um that we don't always hear and i think that needs to really be called out folks see also um within the world of labor management relations that salem kaiser's labor management relations are seen as collaborative and generally functional um, that might be felt more by staff themselves than by students but there really was a call out and an appreciation for that um, in general uh, staff feel like they're well taken care of by the district um, and that's not to say that there aren't occasionally tensions or some frustrations and in the work of teaching in schools there certainly are and so all the more reason why we were um, we were not only pleased but maybe wowed by the level of folks who felt um, really supported and it, sometimes it's hard to do that in a, in a large school district uh, but that is obviously happening here um, i want to just repeat um, and i may, might have said it before but students feel seen and supported and understood by teachers and building administration in salem kaiser public schools now before i move to the next one i want to say and maybe it's obvious these are the strengths that we hear in the district it doesn't mean that there aren't um it doesn't mean that every single child feels cared for in the salem kaiser public schools and i know you know that um so there's always going to be room to grow um there's always going to be folks who might see these bullet points and say well i don't know if i would agree with that and that goes without saying so we're talking we're listing here what the collective um that we saw and heard from your stakeholders, from your families, from your parents, from your teachers, your license, your classified staff, your students. It's not to say that it's 100% in agreement on all of these bullet points. Uh, let's move down to that, that next area, which are what are the complexities and challenges that, um, that our, your new superintendent um, will likely have to tend to when they come on board um, next July. So divisiveness and polarization at the board level and with the community um, is it maybe not a surprise that, that, that you see that there. I will say that we heard that, um, although we heard that throughout our stakeholder groups, we, we, we heard it more than you might think from kids. So um, kids see it and feel it. And um, many students convey that it impacts them and that they want to believe that their board is focused on them, meaning student issues, and not outside issues and political disagreements. It also does impact staff. It distracts them from what they want and need to do for kids. Um, and in some cases, we heard from uh, staff who felt like maybe there were um, parents or parent groups kind of looking over their shoulder and to make sure that they weren't uh, providing some curriculum or writing something that might be um, seen to be inappropriate or improper in a way that maybe they didn't earlier in their career. Um, and um, I guess I, I would also say that um, that um, some of the I want to say that some of this is is more um, I'm struggling for words board um, I think I'm going to leave that there actually uh, and move to that next move to that next bullet point. Um, the next bullet point is a challenge in in many, many districts. And Salem Kaiser is actually doing some really good work in this regard, uh, but it's still a challenge. And uh, we're talking about recruitment and retention of staff and particularly diverse staff. And in the current era, simply recruiting uh, and retention, uh, and I speak as a former HR guy myself, it's never been easy, but it is so much more difficult given the conditions um, in public education right now. Uh, it, is, it, is, um, it is to the district's credit that there is, we learned from the HR department that, um, that a greater percentage of um, candidates of color are being hired than are in the, in the pool of applicants, which means, which shows that there's a real intentionality to making sure that, um, that quality um, individuals are being hired um, with a particular emphasis on diversifying the staff. And at the same time, uh, the workforce does not mirror um, 
in terms of diversity, it does not mirror the student body. And again, this is a body of work that I, I, would, I would say perhaps virtually all school districts face, um, certainly virtually all large districts face. And so I wanna point out that, I, that the fact that this is surfaced um, is actually, there's a, there, there's, it, it's a good thing in that it's recognized and it's a body of work that the, that the district is doing work on, as opposed to it not even being surfaced and recognized as a challenge area. Um, let's move to the third bullet point, which is about school safety and student conduct. Um, there are concerns about school safety and student conduct. And the word concerns at the beginning of that is, is intentional. Um, one of the things that we one of the things that we heard was a disconnect between um, how issues of safety and student conduct are perceived by students in the school and those who are not in school. So safety is obviously, I mean, we can't overstate the importance of school safety in today's era, uh, in, in, the, in the era of schooling right now, whether that is about the infrastructure of school buildings or whether that's about emotional safety. And it's quite clear uh, across the board, across school districts, not limited to Salem-Kaiser, that student behavior in the pandemic, post-pandemic era uh, has become more challenging. And I think some would say even before that we went into the pandemic, it became it was more challenging, but certainly more now. So those are important things to attend to. There are certainly concerns about uh, how behaviors are handled in school and the intensity and uh, amount of um, and at the same time, going back to this notion of concerns, there is a disconnect between what we hear students saying. There's a lot of, we hear really positive feelings by a lot of kids about how they feel seen and known and understood and cared for and emotionally safe in their schools. And again, I'm not saying every single kid feels that all the time, but there is a lot of that in Salem Kaiser. And then there's this disconnect with those who maybe aren't in the schools, uh, grown-ups who aren't in the schools, who might have a perception about what's happening in the school, which might be informed by their own students, but there seems to be a difference there. And so um, one of the things that we'll get to in this final, in the last bullet point is, uh, is there work to be done to actually um, tell a narrative, which is an accurate, true reflection about what is life like as a Salem-Kaiser public school student that might be different than what people maybe think it is. With respect to, um, and I think I think the um, the next item has some has some similarities as well. Um, there is a uh, a wondering um, that we hear in in some of the feedback around academic rigor and about whether it's been, some, some folks would say maybe watered down a little bit or diluted a bit. Um, and I think that's something to really dig into to understand to what extent is that based in reality and to what extent is that not? And what does the data say in terms of that? Um, moving toward the fifth one, which is initiative overload and the desire for robust tailored professional development. Um, this is also not maybe a uniquely Salem-Kaiser matter. Um, staff feel that, uh, not limited to this particular school district, but because we're here talking to Salem-Kaiser, there's a lot more expected from educators today than, than there used to be. Um, the PD piece in particular, I would say, came from classified staff and a need and a desire to have more ability to really handle um, what is expected of them and sometimes feeling that they don't have the skills that they're being asked, uh, asked to take on. Um, and the initiative overload is, is kind of, I, I would say, seen as sort of an uneven implementation. Um, one of the areas where we heard a lot about that was with respect to restorative justice practices. Um, in that maybe there, uh, maybe there in some pockets there's a, there isn't a full understanding of the why, um, so that there are people who who get restorative justice restorative justice they get it, 
But parents and some staff feel, and this goes back to the behavior issue, feel like misbehavior is increasing and teachers and classified staff aren't necessarily provided the support. Um, there are parents that uh, feel that they want to go back to sort of um, I'm pulling back to that student conduct, which is really more of where this one lands. But some folks want to go back to maybe some harsher consequences. But with respect to the restorative justice, I think there's a lack of uniform understanding, or at least this is what we hear in the input of the why and the mechanics around restorative practices. So that might be an example of where um, where folks feel like maybe they're being asked to manage things at the classroom level and don't necessarily know uh, they don't know where they haven't yet developed the skills to be able to, be able to pull that off. That last item I, I, I already did speak to, and I, uh, so I don't know that there's much more I wanna say about that. I think, um, I think, but I will say, although it's sick, it's the bottom of the list, it's a very pronounced thing. Uh, Kathleen and I have a lot of conversation about this, um, this difference of narrative about what's happening in the schools. And, um, and so that's a challenge that will, um, will likely still be present um, next year, but it's something to be thinking about and that candidates can be thinking about as well if they wanna put their name in the hat for how might I, how might I think about um, the distinction of perspectives that might be at play here. Um, so that's, that is, so, Going back to where we said at the beginning, there were three questions that we really posited to your community. What are the strengths? What are the challenges? And what are the qualities and characteristics? Um, with, and that third piece is what we're going to get to momentarily. A one last piece I just want to share about this. So these headings will form a leadership narrative that we will uh, have ready um, for board review. We'll email that out to the board this weekend. You are opening your vacancy board on December 5th, which is early next week. So we'll get that to you ahead of time. And basically what you're gonna hear, you're gonna, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna read a narrative that basically mirrors what I just discussed. So we'll talk about each of these bullet points and it'll give some text or context around that. And this will be um, a document that uh, is typically a very helpful document in the recruiting process so the candidates can get a picture of what, what might it be like to be the superintendent of Salem-Kaiser and what are the things I need to be attending to if I have the great fortune to, um, to take on that role? Thank you, Board. Great, thank you, Hank. Um, Second Vice Chair Guzman Ortiz. I just had a quick question on one of the bullet points, if I may. Um, Hank, the academic rigor bullet point, I missed the, who was that concern coming from primarily again? Can you, I don't see the bullet points anymore, and I didn't hear which bullet point you were referring to, Director. It was the academic rigor and... Um, yeah, let me, I'm gonna ask <laughs> if you would speak to the academic rigor piece. I know I, did, I didn't go into that much depth into that one, because that was really Kathleen's area. So this is a good opportunity for me to pull her into that. I would say that that is a, a concern or a complexity or a challenge that I heard primarily from parents. Um, and it was parents across the board. Uh, it was not just, you know, uh, one single group of parents that I engaged with. It was multiple parents. And I also saw the same comments in the survey responses and also in my review of some of the engagement work that was done with uh, Salem Kaiser's language communities. So it just seemed to be a pervasive sense of people want high expectations for their for their children. And, um, you know, I, they just aren't sure that uh, those are as high as they'd like them to be at this time. You know, there's a lot of focus on other very important things. And I think um, just uh, continuing to, you know, to press on those issues and um, addressing that issue of, of rigor across, you know, all the grades and all the, all the content areas. I also just want to piggyback a little bit on one thing that, that Hank said, and, um, actually a couple of things. I just want to say, um, you know, first of all, what a pleasure it was to be able to engage with so many members of, of your district and your community. And, uh, it's always really hard 
to pare down uh, that list of strengths because there were so many things that people are super proud of, um, rightly so. There are so many things that kids are excited about and having great experiences with. So I just want to make sure that you know, um, you know, it's it's hard to just kind of narrow it down to, to such a short list. Um, but those were the things that stood most out to us as we were reviewing all the data. Director Avila. And thank you, Kathleen. Can you be a little, is there any specific like around um, the 740, Senate Bill 744 graduation requirements, advanced placement, uh, placement opportunities, dual credit opportunities? Can you be, can you define any specifics around, around those concerns? You know, unfortunately, the time that we have for these groups is pretty limited. So the opportunity to really drill down and ask um, for specifics is, is somewhat limited. I mean, we're moving, we're trying to give everybody an opportunity to respond. It's more just like, hey, this is something that we heard. And I, um, I think it's, I heard it often enough that I'd like you to be thinking about that and exploring more what it means. I, I think to your point, um, Director Avila, I, uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, pride or, and, you know, sense of achievement around like the graduation rates for your CTE concentrators, for your students who participated in AVID, um, your IB students, your students who participated in the dual language immersion program. So I, it may well be that people are seeing that level of achievement from those specialized um, groups of, of students and uh, kind of wanting to, wanting to raise the bar for everyone uh, was sort of the sense I had. Thank you. That I also want to say, I'm sorry, I don't want to belabor this part of the conversation, but um, with respect to that second bullet point under challenges and complexity with complexities with respect to uh, diverse staff, students spoke very compellingly to um, the impact on them when uh, they do have staff who who represent um, their ethnicity or their 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 language, and so um, that is where much of uh, that point of emphasis emerged from. Wonderful, thank you. Other questions. Okay, I will stop my screen share then. Oh, Director Chandra Geary, do you want me to pull it back up? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, the, the question is uh, about the process. Now, there are so many different communities and uh, you know, it got 13,000, which is a very good sample size. Now, did it proportionately represent different communities uh, we have? Or in order to get a good understanding, because some communities you know, are small percentage, but they do have a important experience or some immigrant community language. Yes, so I one of the things. Thank you for thank you for calling that out. Um, that I want to be sure to note is uh, just how much we appreciate the outreach that district staff did. <laughs> In engaging the various language communities. And when uh, you see our leadership narrative this weekend, it will paint a, a picture for you of uh, just how many um, different uh, groups in, in your community were, uh, were invited into this engagement process. And we just very much appreciated that and, and heard, you know, very, um, very important insights uh, to be attended to. Thank you. You bet. All right, other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to ask the question about the concerns about school safety and student conduct. In my conversations with both students and parents, there seems to be a lack of immediate uh, attention to any discipline issues that arise. 
Was that something that you found in your surveys? I'll, I'll start that and then I think I'll, I'll ask Kathleen. Uh, this, is, this is a great example where, yes, we did hear, we did hear those voices, um, but we heard a lot of voices and particularly with the behavior issues, which is why you see behavior as clearly a challenge area. Um, so yes, I would say yes, and I want Kathleen to weigh in too. And I, I don't want to diminish that by speaking about students also feeling cared for and safe in their schools. I think both can coexist. Um, Kathleen, would you add anything to that on the behavior and the student conduct? You know, I think, um, I guess I, I think you summarized it well, and I guess I'm thinking of my experiences um, as having served as a superintendent and the fact that a lot of times parents um, of students that are involved in conduct issues or disciplinary issues often feel um, frustrated because uh, the, the administrators aren't able to share specifics about, um, you know, what the outcome was of a particular investigation or what kind of discipline was administered. So. Um, as I heard those comments, I guess I was, um, you know, acknowledging them and um, not necessarily seeing it as something that that struck me as very out of the ordinary from what um, probably parents and some students um, experience or or perceive anywhere. All right. Any other board mm -hmm. member, Director Chandra Geary? So, I mean, I appreciate you pointing out one important thing about academic rigor. And when parents start seeing CTE program as almost like 99 point whatever percentage graduation, and now they are excited about dual language immersion as that possibility. So, I mean, it just speaks to me of what are the potential we have by keeping a new benchmark and applying the principle of equity to lift rest up to keep that as the internal benchmark as opposed to and so it kind of gives an opportunity is that how the parents looked at it what else can we do to get our child into c tech or uh, have it program or uh, not entirely clear mm -hmm. they see that as a potential I they see where they are I didn't hear um, many parents, uh, if any that I can recall in the engagement groups, um, expressing disappointment or concern that they uh, that their child didn't have access to one of those programs like Avid or CTE. Um, so I, I thought that was wonderful. Um, you know that it sounds as though uh, the programs are very accessible to um, to parents and students that want to avail themselves of them. So. Uh, were, they, were they aware of those programs is what I'm not entirely clear. Yes, yes. I believe that Good. that emerged as very much so because it was cited as a strength uh, by so many different groups and, and individuals. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, I will stop my screen share again and go back to our agenda here. Um, so we'll be coming to the candidate, um, the profile, ideal profile soon, but first we're going to move to number three on our agenda, which is public comment. Um, and so in addition to our written public comment that was received between November 16th and 28th, we offered an opportunity to provide public comment during tonight's meeting by calling in or joining via video um, on this Zoom meeting. The opportunity to sign up opened when the agenda was posted Monday about 5 p.m. and closed this morning at 9 a.m. However, no one signed up to comment. Um, Sylvia McDaniel, Director McDaniel, there she is, um, she is our district's uh, director of communications and community relations, and she will now provide us a summary of all of the written public comment that we received, which was very helpful. 
um, the written, com uh, written comment and this summary will also be posted on the district's website for the board meeting. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Director McDaniel. Thank you, Chair Carson Cunningham, uh, Board Directors, Superintendent Perry, Student Advisors. Um, the written comments um, for the superintendent search. We had a total of 16 comments, written comments. Um, they commented on three statements. The first statement was, what statements on the list of criteria are most important to you? Um, the responders could choose up to three of the 15 statements. 10 chose experienced and accomplished educator with a proven track record for leading a district toward greater academic achievement. Four chose steadfast guardian of safe, welcoming and inclusive learning environments. Four chose champions, behavioral and mental health so that students can grow and thrive. Uh, three of the respondents chose uplifts, unifies and builds bridges through engagement with all stakeholders. Um, three chose establishes trust by focusing on shared values and common ground. Uh, the remaining 10 statements were chosen um, zero or, or two times. Uh, the second statement was, is there something you would like to see changed in this list? Uh, nine responders indicated they didn't want to see any other changes. Uh, one responder for each of the following said, someone who is more focused on education than politics, has more than elementary background, understands team building, trust, and collaborative feedback from stakeholders, holds leadership accountable, hears parents' voices, focuses on qualified workforce instead of diverse workforce, doesn't compromise long-held values and catering to specific groups. Um, third statement, um, is there something you would like to see added to this list? Eight of the responders indicated no additions. Um, two of the responders uh, commented, someone with relationship with parents and understands parents, families are key to student success. Uh, one responder for each of the following said, someone who is committed to anti-racist movements, demonstrates integrity and character, focuses on achieving higher academics, ensures children are not politicized and indoctrinated, committed to continued growth of CTEC and partnerships, has experience working with employee associations. And that was the end of those uh, comments. And again, they will be posted on the uh, district website. Thank you, Director McDaniel. And thank you to all the community members who took time to weigh in on um, our ideal profile. We really appreciate it. With that, we'll move on to number four on our agenda, which is our discussion of the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools ideal profile for the next superintendent. Um, and Hank Harris will help facilitate us through this discussion. Um, first, I'm gonna just do a little bit of an overview of the process for tonight. Um, so our approach is that the meeting's not intended to be a time to brainstorm, but as a time to review and discuss the suggested changes from the feedback from the board members, the public, um, what we heard um, tonight from Hank and um, Kathleen, um, and then come to consensus on changes. Director Hying, do you, do you have a question right now? Yes, and you can tell me when the appropriate time is. The requested change I had did, was not reflected correctly. And so let me know when that time is because it's in there, but it's not where it should be or how it should be. Okay, great. I'm outlining the process right now. Um, so 
after reviewing all the feedback from everyone, board, community, um, all the details shared that Hank and Kathleen just shared from all of the different groups that um, they met with, um, the goal is to come to consensus on changes that reflect the values of the board as a whole. And so again, Hank and I will work in tandem tonight to facilitate that discussion and hopefully gain consensus. Um, we do need to vote later in the night on the profile. Um, so here's how I would like to run the rest of this process. We'll use the round robin, which we've become accustomed to, to hear suggested changes from each board member. Um, if there's consensus on a change, then we'll make the change. If there's not consensus on a change, then I'll ask if there's a board member who wants to make a motion to include the change and then call for a second on the motion. Um, and so if there's a motion and a second, then we'll take a vote um, and we will make or not make the change depending on the outcome of the vote. Um, so right now, um, the superintendent, I believe, is going to be the one to share her screen now to bring up the document as it stands. And I want to be really clear that we received all that feedback. The things that you see now on the screen that are in bold black are the things that were incorporated from the various individuals giving feedback into this process. Um, so those are the changes since the last version um, as our attempt to start at a point where we've incorporated the vast majority of what directors brought forward. Not everything you see will be word for word what the, the director requested. Um, it may not also be right in that exact place in the profile as requested by the board director, but I did my very best to try to incorporate um, what I thought the intent and meaning of the request was into the language of the ideal profile that was put together by Hank and Kathleen. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Hank to start the process of um, walking through the document. Hank, Hank, are you there? I am. I'm sorry. Okay. I was I was talking, but apparently nobody heard me because I was muted. So. Um, <laughs> oh, and I I'd also like to welcome um, one of our student advisors. I'm sorry, um, student advisor McDonald did join us quite a while ago, and I wanted to acknowledge his presence at the meeting. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, I think in terms of an opening comment, the only thing I actually want to want to well, let me say a few things. So one is just to, again, contextualize this document. This is, when we talk about the three questions, what's great, what are the challenges, what are the qualities and attributes and experiences, this document is that third question. Um, one of the things that was really powerful in, uh, in Salem-Kaiser was the student-centeredness of so much of the input. Um, and what I mean by that is when people describe the ideal superintendent or what they were looking for in their next superintendent uh, or what they'd want to see in candidates, so often it was about, it was framed in student language, um, whether that's somebody who connects well to kids or somebody who puts students at the center of it all. Um, and there were, there are others, um, many others, which is why when we put together this document, um, and we were looking at it together, I remember Kathleen and I talking about like, we haven't really seen an ideal profile that was so student focused. And because the ideal profile comes out of the input we get, that's what you get. So we think that's a huge positive and something to kind of pat the district on the back for, uh, recognizing that certainly in our opinion, but I think in the opinion of the district that uh, the student really, is supposed to be at the center of the work of the schools. Uh, I suppose some people might think that's obvious, but it's not obvious. It's not everywhere where students are actually um, so so saliently represented in what people say they want their superintendent to be focused on. So um, what you are looking at, board, just to echo what, what your chair just said, is a, um, is a new version of this document, which takes into 
uh, account the feedback that was um, that was put forth over the last several days. Uh, I really appreciate a lot of folks um, worked hard to move us along through this process. So I just want to, um, I just want to, if I may, just quickly uh, call out um, Olga Cobb and Alice um, Stuckmeyer and um, and tonight uh, Chair. Thank you for um, helping move this all along. I think that we're ready to facilitate. So um, unless there are any questions about kind of the, what we're doing, I think we're ready to facilitate, which would be to um, to begin your round robin. Is that what we should, is that what you're thinking, Chair? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. So do we just take, so take the document as a whole and do round robin, or do you want to break yeah. it into chunks? No, I, well, I, I would say if, if we do a round robin and if there is a board member that wants, well, you will do a round robin. So you'll call on each board member in turn. And I think a board member could surface uh, any particular item that they wanted. And ideally the comment will be specific to language. So not a brainstorming, like, I wonder if we could add something about something isn't really what we'd want if we can avoid that, but rather more, I would like to modify the fourth bullet point so that it says this instead of that. Um, and these bullet points are not numbered. Um, so you'll need to, you'll need to just um, probably just identify, just be clear whether you're saying the third one down or the fourth from the bottom or somehow so everybody knows which bullet point you're speaking to. Okay. Great. And, and I'll, I'll type as people talk if they give it to me in concise statements. Um, and then if it's a go, I'll leave it in. If it's not, then I'll take it out. So I'll just try to monitor the conversation that way so people can see it. Okay, great. Um, Director Hyen, do you wanna, I saw your hand up a second ago. Go ahead. Thank you for letting me start uh, because I only have one thing and then I'll oh. be easy, easy after that. Uh, so what I had requested was that the first statement under and who I requested that it say understands we educate students on behalf of their parents slash families and as such give priority to the to the parents slash families voices uh, where this ended up being put. Would you just say that one more time Marty for me. So sure. I, wasn't I did after. email it to, to Alice. Do you want me to email it to you? No, just say it one more time. And the grammar may not be correct. So. Okay. Uh, understands we educate students on behalf of their parents slash families and as such give priority to the parents slash families voices. One thing that we've been hearing a lot is parents don't feel heard. And if it wasn't for parents, there'd be no students, right? We educate their children. And where this was put, uh, which includes parents and families uh, on the third bullet underneath and who, it to me, it, it seems as parents are more of an afterthought. And I think parents need to be a priority. We need to value our parents and we need to make sure they know that they are valued. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So do we want to have then discussion on adding this bullet? Um, do other board directors have comments? Director Avila. Yeah, um, Director Hyde, if you can clarify, if you'd like the education that the parents are requesting to be taught or more on behalf of understand that we incorporate or include parents as uh, strong partners of the education of our students. It's not meant to say that parents are going to be in the classroom dictating everything that's going on. It, it is a partnership. We are doing this on their behalf. It is their God-given responsibility to educate their children. We are doing this on their behalf. They play a critical role 
they need to be valued and listened to. And yes, some things could ta be taken to extreme. That's not what's meant here. Uh, but parents do not feel heard and they need to feel heard because again, you know, they can, they're not happy. They can pull their kids out. We're, we're doing this for them on their behalf. Thank you for the clarification. Director Chandra Geary. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I can live with the original document, but I see where you're coming from uh, when you talk, explain it this way. Uh, but even the legally speaking, parents do have a choice. Uh, that's what I learned in the OSBA conference. So in a way, I thank all the parents for sending their children to our public schools because of your making a choice to send to our public schools. I know you had plenty of choices, but you chose public schools. So thank you very much. That allows us to educate more people, including the ones who needs to be, you know, equitably supported and lifted. So that is how I see the statement, what uh, Director Hyen said. So because they have a, uh, basically the legal right to have their children, they can choose where it is, but they chose our school. So we are grateful to you for sending your school. That's how I interpret. Maybe I'm wrong. Somebody else can explain it. So I like that. And I can live with the rest of the document by including that and it kind of, this is not to say that we are taking the focus away from students. I really want us to understand that the way I see, because a lot of times when immigrant parents come, it is because we want our children to have the best quality of education and for children to be safe. That's why we would like to be involved. And uh, because in the process, we are also learning the system in this country so that we can do our best. So I like this, this captures both from a voice of an immigrant, parents and so many communities, and also is child focused. It doesn't mean we are not thinking of our children. We love our children as much as anybody else. Uh, we love our children more than anybody, any system can love the, our children. So that's how I see this. So I like this uh, version of it. Thank you, Director Hayen for explaining it. Director Hyen, would you be open to um, like moving? Because I, I wanted, you know, I, I attempted unsuccessfully to incorporate um, what you had suggested into the bullet where it starts with uplifts. I'm wondering if we move that one up to the very top. So it's the first bullet, like you're saying, and we add language around um, prior, which prioritizes and includes parents and families or something like, or parent and family voice, if that would get to your intent. Uh, moving that bullet up would be okay. What I want to make clear is that... Um, prioritization, the emphasis on the importance. I, I don't want parents and families to be looked at as an afterthought. I mean, the whole community is important, but mm -hmm. the parents of the children are more important to me, you know, and as a parent, you know, my number one thing is was my child. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanna make sure that our parents are treated the way they should be, they should be listened to and, and not treated as an afterthought or, or a nuisance, which some of them feel like they are. What if, okay, what if we just made it a sec, made it a slightly shorter bullet that says, and who prioritizes the voices of parents and families as a standalone bullet? I'm sorry, I, repeat it again. Who prioritizes and include, so it would say, and who, you know, up above, uh -huh. prioritizes and includes parent and family voices. How about prioritizes and values? That, that works for me. In oh, Director Guzman Ortiz, sorry. Yeah, I and I just, I just, yeah, I just had one comment and I think I absolutely, again, as a parent and um, having worked with families and parents for a long time, and that's one of my big drivers for the work that I do nowadays, I. 
I, I think when I'm looking at this, I'm really just trying to keep my eyes on the large system, right? And everybody who is impacted and who we are here to serve. And so I'm feeling a little conflicted with calling out, like only like prioritize this families, um, not because I don't think it's important, but because I, I want to hold an equal weight when it comes to like children, families, educators, and everybody who is a part of the system. And so I I would prefer that we keep language that kind of leverages everybody as important versus saying like additional weight on one or another. Um, when we've done such an intentional job at reaching out to partners and families and, and um, educators educators community of all types so how can we balance all of the different perspectives um um that's where a little bit of my conflict is with just calling out prioritizing parents and families um alone my comment on on that mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so again without parents there would be no students and um, there was another point I was going to make, but it just flew out of my head. Uh, and parents can choose to, to take their kids elsewhere. I mean, I just don't think we have given parents the the focus the, and the voice uh, that we should have. Having been a parent dealing with a district before, before Superintendent Perry, I want to make that clear, um, really getting the runaround and, and not treated well and basically just like you're a nuisance go away and i just parents are important <laughs> we don't have a job without parents because we wouldn't have students without parents so i understand that there's other groups that are important as well like our taxpayers and other community members who um you know uh the the kids that graduate they affect the entire community, you know, and how well trained they are and, and all, all those different things. I get that. But I, parents to me are just on a plane by themselves. That's my, just my opinion. Uh, you know, as, oh, as I'm hearing. Dr. Salazar. Yes, I have a, maybe a, a way of putting them both together is that I feel that there needs to be both all of the uh, elements and factions that are involved but probably a key word I would say there would maybe be collaboration because uh, I know that the parents, you know, we have to have, as um, Director Hyden says, we have to have the parents, we have to have their help, you know, I think for anything that we do, but I think there is also other uh, elements in the community that we also have to have and to have the, that collaboration I think is is something that that we need to have uh, for the success of the students. Thank you, Director Salazar. Director Avila. Yeah, I really uh, I feel the same sentiment with um, Second Vice Chair was Ortiz and a little bit with uh, Director Salazar saying. Um, and to me, I think we're the word prioritizes and if we can value and includes instead of prioritizing of keeping that equal weight and not taking away from our educators our teachers who you know who this is their career and profession that are are educating the students um i just feel if we put prioritizes in there um takes that away but we but we need to come up with this language that sees parents as um critical partners uh, within within the system, within the classrooms, within the district. So I would like to get to a point where where that can satisfy everybody here and keep that equal weight. I'm Director Guzman Ortiz. Sorry, I just, I guess too, I know we've, we've kind of discussed this one for a bit and I know that um, Chair, you had suggested moving that, I believe it was the third bullet. Oh, I lost it now. The superintendent moved, oh. yeah, I moved it up. Uplifts to the top. Okay. So uplifts, unifies and builds bridges through engagement with all community. And then that's where we were 
where I had added the feedback from, I think it was both director Chandra Giri and director Hyen to include parents, the call out parents. And so I had put it, I think there, but it didn't have some of the like describing words around value or priority or that kind of thing. Student advisor, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I guess my suggestion was like, if it if I read which includes collaboration with parents and families um, to uh, Director Salazar's point and just kind of make it a, con a more concise sentence versus How about which values and mm -hmm. prioritize it or values collaborates and includes families and parents? Yeah. With that, can we build consensus around that? How are we feeling? I can't see Marty. Um, there you are. <laughs> I, I need a moment to read it. And okay. <laughs> so just give me a moment. I'm scrolling through the, the squares to see everyone. I think we need some collaborate for that with. community period or some sorts of just very long sentence for my. <laughs> but, but I like what it's saying. I mean, M -dash. Evaluating, collaborating and including. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you need to grammar fix it or whatever. Okay. I, I, like, I like those words in there. Values, collaborates and includes. I, I like those words in there. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Before, before uh, ahead, Isaac's, mm -hmm. yeah, before Isaac says, um, I think in there putting, where do we have uh, includes parents and families as critical partners? Sorry, go ahead, um, Isaac, if that's okay, Chair. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was going to say something about collaboration, but I'm actually, I'm really satisfied with the statement that we just worked out. Just a question was where, where are we, I feel like there's a live, like we're working on this live. Is there like a space where we're doing that? Cause I, I can't find like where it, like, I can't see where we're like typing out this new. Oh, sentence. it should, Christy's sharing her screen. Maybe it got hidden behind your zoom window. Oh, that. It's not a live document. It's a word document. Let me see if I can find it oh, real quick. I will. It's just the superintendent is just sharing it on the Zoom screen. We're not all in the document at the same time. To sorry if that helps clarify. Okay, maybe I'm missing the Zoom screen. I'm try, I'm I'll try to find it. I'll let you guys know if I have okay. problems. Thank you. Um, Director Shonda Geary. Well, thank you, Chair. You know, I mean, I, of course, we are kind of wordsmithing here, but the intent is parents mm -hmm. are the primary or the first teachers or, you know, every parent loves their, I mean, the one of the Chukusi, Chuk Island parent explained to me, families and parents love their children more than anyone or any agency can. And to me, all of us are collaborating with parents and families in helping uh, focus on the children. So I think the uh, probably that's how I see it. When parents bring their little kids to our school, we are all collaborating with them and helping them. And mm -hmm. we are pushing the thing. So we can capture that, hopefully, where there is a central place for families and, and parents or guardians. In some cases, some of the islanders, children are living with their guardians rather than parents here. Yeah, I think and that's why we use the term family to try to incorporate. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then all of us are collaborating with them to make sure their hopes, dreams, aspirations come true at the end. So that we are all pushing the car in the same direction rather than saying one is more, one is less. That's how right. I like to see. And you know, do you think this statement now reflects what you just said? So, which, so my sense would be how, as a district, and board, we collaborate with parents slash families, or in this case, I want to use the word family in a broader sense. Right, but to... what we're looking for right now is for this the ideal candidate to do Correct. these things. We're not. That's what, that's what the candidate can work, uh, lead the district in such a way that 
all of us collaborate with the parents and families in order to uh, focus on the children and their future. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I see it. Um, because then ultimately, we are all collaborating with the parents and they bring their little children so that we all focus on the children. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see that Hank's hand is up. Uh, I I have both um, just a minor comment and on the syntax, um, but I also think we might want to, if it feels like there's a consensus, maybe go with that and go to the next one. And if mm -hmm. there isn't a consensus, maybe move forward and circle back to this at the end. Um, so that's my my bigger picture. My my more in the weeds is um, the, the the placement of the word collaborates collaborates doesn't seem to be syntactically uh, correct. And so because um, you can value and include parents, but you can't really collaborate parents. Uh, and so I wondered if it, it might be better to say which um, this is a little clunkier, but w it might be better to say which values and includes parents and families as critical partners with whom we collaborate. We'll let, how about we let Alice wordsmith her um, the perfect grammar. Person. She's yeah. our queen of that. Yes, excellent idea. Thank um, you. So and when I you have the right words, Alice will put them in the right order. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as long as it doesn't change meaning. And can I add one thing? Um, I think we might want to add um, caregivers in there because we do have um, caregivers that expands that parent definition a little bit. And I also wonder if saying families as critical partners are to use as collaboration, but we'll let Alice um, give, us, give us the words. Okay. Um, so I think we can then delete the strike through one for clarity. And then, oh, Director Hyan. Yeah, I was going to say to Superintendent Perry's comment, yeah, I was, I put families in there because I know not every student um, lives with their parents. And I also understand we have some students that are homeless and uh, there, there's no way to capture all those different, different things. Um, so parents and then whatever word maybe that can capture the other circumstances a student may find themselves in would be great. Thank you. All right, so um, Director Chandra Giri, you had said with that those changes you feel like yeah. mostly good about the remainder. You see your your yeah. suggestions and everything included. Well, it's. I think this is a beautifully written document, and uh, you know, this is going to be summarized in a way you're going to look for it. Ultimately, it captures all the important elements that we are looking for. More than the words, I think I'm looking for the important elements because ultimately you can't go around interviewing people with the and or grammar ways. You just have mm -hmm. to take the gist of what this captures. It captures everything. It's so beautifully done. I like the way it captures the bilingual, multilingual, multicultural. It values the primacy of the families and you know whatever the definition of family you want to go with. It Still, it centers around ch children first as the main focus. It helps us push the car in the same direction, as I call it. And it's data driven so that it mitigates all kinds of uh, our own implicit biases and it kind of gives us a way to hold ourselves accountable and demonstrate to the community and the families who so, you know, thankfully, because of their generosity, they chose public schools, they had choices, they made this choice. So we want to keep that and keep doing better and better as we move. So I support this. I would like to make no other changes. Great, thank you. Okay, let's go on to first, or second Vice Chair Guzman Ortiz for our round robin. If there's any additional comments, suggestion, changes you'd like to see. 
I had made a comment about this, and I, I think I just like to verbalize it on the um, the variety of data driven approaches um, in terms of recognizing the quantitative and qualitative data that goes into that. So I don't think it's necessary that we like write it out, but I do think that that's just going to be important, and, and just wanted to highlight the importance of that understanding that narrative and stories are also important to kind of feed and um, inform decisions in, in the district. So you don't, do you think you want to add anything? I don't want to make it wordy, but if we are on consensus that data captures the different types of, then I'm okay with uh, um, keeping it as it is. But I, I just kind of wanted to highlight that importance at least to me what you know all encompassing data means so unless anyone feels like we need to add it but if we're all in agreement that um when we see data it includes that both qualitative and quantitative i'm okay leaving it as is director chandra carey uh, you know second vice chair guzman Ortiz, thank you for explaining that because when you say data we often think of numbers and numerals but data can also mean capturing a qualitative experience or lived experience. So, and the data should ideally match with people's lived experience. That's how, otherwise we are simply doing data impu imputation, you know, just trying to take some number and make it fit in. So, I mean, you can go into the weeds, but I like the idea that our data should, it should broad category of data-driven approaches. And then we can, like our KPI does, we can take qualitative data or quantitative data or whatever way we want to. But the whole idea as a superintendent uses something more than just their own personal uh, impression as opposed to something that they can demonstrate consistently. That's what I was hoping when I suggested data to them. So there's something objectivity is there. Otherwise it'll be like I said, so that goes and that way 10 of us can have 10 different, I said so, and that may not hold good tomorrow, right? Ultimately, mm -hmm. we have to go back to our community and parents and say, this is what we are doing. This is how we are making changes. That's what I meant. By it could be a quantitative data. It could be a qualitative data, but something that is more than I said so. <laughs> good point. Um, okay, Director Avila, your turn. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, the top, in the top um, bullet points, number three at the end, after including families, I think I would like to add um, with including families with cultural competence and cultural humility. So this, I, I want to have this person, you know, really knowledgeable of, of diverse cultural differences, how we engage with, with different communities, how we need to approach with them, how do we need to speak with them, um, and having, you know, having that level ready so they can come in and really be effective uh, communicators and listeners and being able to make changes along alongside with our communities. Could I make a friendly suggestion? Absolutely. That we move the statement that you just made to after knowledgeably. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't want to wordsmith it. So I just kind of found that. Um, so I think that, if we said yeah. and speaks compellingly, compelling, we, knowledgeably with cultural competence and cultural humility comma empathetically empathetically and with ease in a multitude of venues and with a variety of diverse audiences including families that it might become more meaning yeah i was going to allow that you know if everybody appreciated this um then allow alice to wordsmith it <laughs> Any um, more discussion on adding that as a, it's sort of, a, so two additional describers 
of how someone would intentionally listen and and speak right. knowledgeably. And 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 one to the extent I think something that we did last year was you know listening to our um, Pacific Islander students and just understand how important um, that we can make the small change of adding uh, their rice to their lunch menus. Mm -hmm. Um, to feeling them, you know, in, incorporated and, and being heard and seen. So things like that. Mm -hmm. Director Hyen? I'm um, not sure I like the word cultural humility. I think I understand uh, what you're trying to say with that, but maybe there's a, a different choice of word. I think we want to be you know, um, honest if we don't understand and we want to be learners and be willing to learn and, and, you know, just be, um, humble or like, I don't, I don't understand, help me understand the, the appropriate way or, or whatever. I, I don't know. It's just, uh, the word just kind of throws me off. I don't know if there's a better word. That's just my thought. I mean, I won't, I won't fight it. It's just another you word just, probably be better. I just don't know what it is. I think you just perfectly described Marty what it is. <laughs> that was awesome. So being, you know, open and listening to cultures where cultures that like aren't your primary culture and and you know that's exactly what the humility piece is. So would you accept a small friendly change like cross cultural competence and cross cultural humility because we have so many cultures uh, uh, Director Avila, would you consider that? Would would, would empathy be a better word than humility? Because I'm I'm a little uh, confused with humility. Also, I understand what Osalvo, uh, Director Osalvo, is uh, wanting to uh, convey, but I don't know how that would come across, you know, to other applicants and stuff that we were looking at. So to, to so to yeah to those two points where um, Chair Ashley um, Ashley stated on the response to Chair Hyen or sorry Director Hyen, you know the humility part is just coming someone to come in and say I don't know everything, I don't know and understand, and I'm willing to learn and listen to those around my team, my educators, our students, our communities. Empathetically is uh, going to be a little bit different. It's a different, um, a different attitude, a different skill. I think that's important to call out alone. Um, and then to Director Chandigiri's, you know, we could say uh, cross-cultural or even multicultural competence um, to to incorporate that. So I hope, I hope that. And then I don't know if uh, Director Guzman Ortiz has something to speak on this as well. She's had her hand up. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just make a quick comment. Um... I, I really appreciate you bringing up the cultural humility, Director Avila. Um, I was actually speaking about this just earlier this morning, and I, I will say that um, as a daughter of uh, immigrant parents, Mexican parents, humility is a huge value of ours. And to me, seeing humility here actually feels really reaffirming of what even like my culture has um, instilled in me, right? To be humble and to show up with that learning mind and that open heart always. So to me, it's actually really reassuring, really reaffirming to kind to see the word humility spelled out because I have heard this, you know, time and time again growing up. Um, and it's always about, it's a strong value that I carry um, myself. And I think it is important for us to try, you know, to make to highlight this in terms of searching for a new leader for a district, somebody who is willing to show up and say, hey, you know what, I don't have all of the answers, but I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to learn. Should we do multicultural, multi, uh, um, to mirror that we have multilingual, multicultural above? Is that the most inclusive language? It's consistent. I like it. Okay. But uh, can I say something about that? Yeah. You know, the real reality is we have to hire a superintendent. And uh, a good start will be just cross-culturally trying to learn. But to be if really looking for somebody who is multiculturally competent, by June we need a superintendent. So uh, I'm just trying to be a little bit more, you know, even I like the way humility, cultural humility is also fine, but 
even cross culturally or within the same thing just to say i don't know yeah i want to learn and listen because if you really start looking so much with fine tune i don't know how to find such a human being with 110 different culture uh student advisor mcdonald yeah um i i am really happy with the way it's written right now and i just wanted to kind of again i think humility is a really good word here because um especially with like empathy empathy is really important characteristic but i think that does get thrown around a little bit more and i think humility um will have a bit more of an impact on the reader because it's um it's not used as much and it's kind of a different um trait and i also think it emphasizes that kind of um it's more of a mindset and so to have the mindset of humility and to always have to be learning i think that's really important especially as we hope to have a superintendent who sticks with us for years and years and years and the amount of change that we've seen and we know will happen over years like that's a trait that will allow them to make good decisions in the midst of change and whereas like other things might be um not as not as good of a mindset so i just yeah, i really like this word here and i think it will um attract a, a good superintendent right okay um do we have consensus around adding multicultural competence and multicultural humility is there anyone opposed i'm trying to scroll through hank has his hand up and i also just have i do think it's multicultural competence and cultural humility i don't know if it's multi i don't know if the multi fits over there okay. and is that what you yeah. were going to say as well that's exactly what i was going to say um i want to make sure i understand everything that i'm going to be saying then and i i, I this mm -hmm. is exactly what i was thinking um that makes sense to me just it might sound, it might flow better and this might be an alice thing that we don't but it might if we do make that change and i it might flow better if the cultural humility precedes the multicultural competence it might just sound better but i was going to say exactly what your superintendent said perfect all right let's see let's move unless there's any opposition i'll move to director salazar for any overall comments or feedback in our round robin no i i think it's very good and i i appreciate the clarification on the uh cultural um humility because i do think i'm glad to see that included in in in, in the form that it has been done wonderful all right did i skip anyone director hyan you're ready for your next round robin Let i think know. we're ready <laughs> okay so i didn't think i had anything else and maybe it needs a clarification or something like this so i'm talking about the fourth bullet from the bottom okay it says values by literacy understands the instructional needs of English language learners and can lead implementation of dual language expansion. And so I know that we've been working a long time on our um, Eng English language learners and I, I believe they're in pretty good hands. We've got some good programs going. Uh, my concern is for the native English speakers as we're trying to become you know, have biliterate uh, students in, in Spanish and English, right? Is the, the goal. And so my concern is we need, do we need to um, make sure that's a point of clarification in there? Because now I'm not a teacher, but is there a different method for, for those students or is it the exact same method? You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know. Do, do we have to do something different for our English, uh, native English language speakers to get them up to speed with Spanish? Christy, do you understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> I, I do because, um, oops. Eee, there I go. I do understand because you're talking about kids that are uh, English speakers learning Spanish right. and kids that are Spanish. So I wonder if the instructional needs or any of any other language. I yeah, mean, it's, it's just all, language. Not all Spanish speakers that are yeah. learning English, right? It might just it might just be language learners 
um, that and just take out the English language learners part of that statement. Um, but I understand what you're saying. Okay, I would be okay with that one because that's what we want. Hmm. Director Shonda Carey. Well, I, I am. This is my pet peeve, so please stop me if I go too much into it. I mean, to me, it's it's uh, we have to call out the emerge this program, the dual language immersion model, which will really be good for children who are native English speakers, who are native Sp Spanish speakers, and other language. And I really, the way I see is for the next 20, 30 years, the superintendent will have to be committed to keep expanding because we've got so many languages. So we're just starting with Spanish and English. So I would like that to be called out that not only the instructional languages of emerging English language learners, but having the dual language immersion or multilingual immersion as a concept throughout this district because that is how I would like to see the new superintendent take leadership because the ch families from Chukis family asked, when will Chukis be taught along with English to start with? And then I had others who are asking language because they are beginning to see the value of more than one language as the doorway to have bicultural competency. And it's not just, we can't stop at this level. Director Chandigiri, we removed the English language learners. So it, it's just language learners. And so that can be Spanish and English or, or anything else, whatever languages uh, we want them to be literate in. And it it's, and then it speaks to the leading of the implementation of the dual language expansion. Yeah, they have to be committed towards really not just start and stop. That's what I'm hoping the new superintendent takes leadership. You know, the Washington state passed a law saying that's okay. a standard throughout. So I would like to see Salem Kaiser take that leadership in our state in which we can. Right. So I, I, that statement, then, do you think that captures it, Director Chandra Gary? And lead implementation of dual language expansion? Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the intent. I mean, that's the best we can put it in this document, ultimately. It's for the board to make sure we hold the superintendent accountable to continue till the end, even beyond our lifetime. Literally, that's what it is going to take. You okay. can't take the pedal, foot off the pedal. That's what I'm trying to say, putting it bluntly. Mm -hmm. Just just wondering if we, um, as I was hearing uh, Director Shandagiri speak, if we can add that and can commit to lead and that we were like really emphasizing that commit, that desired commitment to continue leading the effort. So thank you, that in thank you for that. Because every year the budget will have to be allocated, number of schools will have to be identified, recruitment and oversight. So there's a lot of commitment we need, and we just can't let go. Okay, good point. Thank you, thank you. I like that. Um, I saw Director Avila, you had your hand up, but went down, Hurry. Right. Well, still a wrench in there, you know, I think, I, I hear what Director Hyen's saying, but we also have English language learners as our, as a, as a, as a subgroup of our students with, that we measure highly on. Um, so was the intent in the beginning of really focusing on English, English language learners and getting them up to, you know, the par of our native speakers. And so do we need to be intentional about committing programs, resources to English language learners as well through here? So I feel like it it was addressing English language learners. Now it's now it's kind of we're not being intentional anymore and then lumping everybody in to develop language. I mm -hmm. So we have been intentional, you know, about our English language learners. My concern was, as uh, we are trying to graduate, the goal, I believe, is biliterate, uh, educated students, that the way it was written, yes, it pointed out the English language learners, 
but it forgot about the English native speakers. Uh, so, you know, we can have two different statements or something. I mean, every child's important and giving them, each one of them, the best education we can and, and trying to get them to be biliterate, you know, is the goal, right? This, that's this goal. And, um, and they may not even be native Spanish speakers. They might be native French speakers and they're coming in and needing to learn English and potentially Spanish. I'm not sure how, how that works with a dual language program. Is it just English and French or is it English Spanish? English. But I just felt like we were forgetting about the native English speakers by not saying something. And that's why, you know, each, again, each child is important. I added a statement here. This is a bit redundant with the second, with the next bullet, but there is a point of um, our students that are learning English are one of the highest risk group, lowest performing groups if we don't really attend to them. So um, I don't know, I do, um, I'm thinking about what um, Director Avila said about that. Um, and so maybe it's a separate bullet because we have dual language, which should take, um, values by literacy and commits to leading the implementation of dual language expansion and understands the instructional needs of students learning English as a separate bullet. Mm -hmm. Might be a way to address both. That looks good to me. And, Thank you. And to that point, uh, Superintendent Perry, I, um, I love maybe also kind of your feedback because I, I've been thinking a lot. I know we've heard about this as well. And when we think about recent and arrivals, newcomers, refugee students, and how we also are kind of in a different um, situation contextually than other districts across the state. And just wanting to really highlight that, is that something that would make sense? And this kind of goes for everyone to include in that same bullet, right? Like the instruct the unique instructional needs of both English language learners and um, recent, I don't, I don't know, I, I know we use the language, the term recent arrivals in our KPI reports. Um, mm -hmm. But right. I just kind of wanted to add and include that because I, I know we've talked about it. We're, we're looking at um, perhaps, you know, having more families and, and students uh, in, in the district in the, in the coming year or so. Um, so just want to really highlight that if we can. Yeah, that's the kids who are on my mind, too, as I was typing that. So I put it as a separate bullet. So I have a clarification question, and maybe I'm not understanding something. So... Um, are, see, how do I say this? Are the unique needs, uh, for those, for those students who have a need to learn English, are they all recent arrivers? No. I guess. No. Okay. That, that was what I need clarification on, because if they're all recent arrivers, then, then we would need to get rid of part of that sentence, I think. No, um, and I only would say add recent arrivers because we do really have um, an influx of students that are recent arrivers to the country okay. and to oh. Salem. I, and, yeah, and I suppose you could have kindergartners or first graders who have been here a number of years um, and haven't been in school and been around English that much yet, so, okay. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, as you can see it now with the the bullet broken into two, and everyone live with that, feel good about it? Looking for consensus? I, I have a quick question, if I may. Yep, just one sec, I'm looking to see. Osvaldo, you good? Okay. Okay, go ahead, Director Shandigari. In that uh, place where the cursor is dual language expansion, are we referring to dual language immersion expansion, immersion program expansion? Yes. Okay, do you think we should call it out as because that was a model that in the work explained to us during the training, mm -hmm. dual language immersion expansion, because that's different from the what is that the scaffolding model or what's other model that they had? Leading the implementation of dual language immersion. Experience. Thanks.
Thank you. Okay, other, we're on our second round of round robin. I don't remember where we left off. I think Director Hyen, you went first. Director Chandra Giri, anything additional? I, I think we, I'm happy with what we have and we have captured everything so beautifully and nice way. Okay, thank you. Um, second Vice Chair Guzman Ortiz. Yeah, to that other bullet point that we added of understands unique constructional needs, um, I would like to add something beyond understanding, like what is the actionable piece to that, right? Because it, one thing is to understand, but then another is to either like value or commit or so I was, I had a word and I just lost it, but. Um, mm -hmm. Implementation strategy? Like understands and, and is committed to uh, I don't know if I want to add committed again, but uh, I had a word and I completely. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can come, we can just come back if you want to think about it. Thank you. I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of go beyond the just general understanding mm -hmm. and wanted to add something on yeah. that. Okay, awesome. Um, let's see, Director Salazar. Uh, no, I just, I really am impressed with the discussion regarding uh, dual, uh, dual language. And uh, with that also the levels of those students as they progress from the elementary schools two through two to the high schools. And as he says here, the unique instructional needs of those students as they as they progress through K-12. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with what's been developed. So Wonderful. Oh, Director Shonda Gary. The second vice chair, would you consider understand and lead implementation of needed programs to serve the unique instructional needs of students learning English and recent arrivals so as to close the achievement gap. Understand and lead the unique instructional you needs. Know, I understand and commit to leading implementation of needed programs to serve the unique instructional needs of students learning English, learning English and recent arriving English learners so as to close the achievement gaps. Because implementing a program with an outcome in mind, that's what I was thinking. If you would agree to that, that's fine. Of just calling out the closing mm -hmm. the achievement gap. In, in because there. equity should lead to an outcome. Equity doesn't lead to a, a an outcome which has the best possible outcome, then it's not equity in my mind at least. Because that will fit in with our equity lens that, okay, we are not only serving the unique needs, but we are implementing a program or the best model which will lead to closing the achievement gap. That way we lift those students who are English language learners and Ryle group, recent arriving English language learners. That's another four years or so we can call them Ryle. After that, we have to call them something as English language. I would like to see their closing the gap because if you see our data and KPI, there is some work to be done with that. Yeah, and I guess I'm wondering because if we're doing work on our like on our policies and our results policies, I'm just wondering how we can circle that. Right, we're not making statements. I think in any of these about okay. the why, right. um, but I agree that is the why, um, Director Chandra Gary. I just don't want to get too, yeah. um, too many words. Like maybe we can just, Director Guzman Ortiz, you can think of. Um, because I want them to implement something which is going to bring some meaningful change. 
Right. Otherwise, we'll only be describing the problem. That's not enough. For but them. what we're describing right now is sort of a, you know, we want them, this amazing candidate to have an understanding and commitment okay. All right. to serving students who have unique instructional needs because this is a um you know unique part of our population in our schools uh, i think we all we're all in agreement about the importance and the why i just don't know if we want to get into sort of outcomes based language in this document because just like the next bullet talks about values by literacy and commits to leading implementation of mm -hmm. dual language immersion, which is a model which we all know have one of the good results. It's the same way I was thinking, understands and commits to leading implementation of a model which will serve the unique, which is the best practice or serve the unique instructional need. If some superintendent has had ex experience on that, why not? look for someone who has worked in that area. Let's say from the New Mexico program, somebody applies. We should grab that person. I, I like how it is, if anything, I'm just like understands and commits to leading the implementation of inclusive and unique, like just including that like perhaps inclusive, unique instructional needs. And like, we're already kind of calling out, you know, that it is to, to, to respond to what the need is versus. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, that works. That incorporates your your language, Satya. I think. Okay. Right. To share with that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, my experience with uh, dual languages and uh, ESL programs is that they uh, show results at different times. You know, it could be like a two or three year span where you can see uh, a tremendous growth, and up to that time, you may not see a lot of growth in the initial phase of the programs. So to say right away it's going to show a decrease in the gap, I don't know what metrics we would use in order to, uh, you know, validate those, those, mm -hmm. those, those, those issues. But I think that yeah. it, over time it will show uh, progress and, and, and uh, we'll make that gap close, but at different stages, it's going to show different uh, indicators of that improvement. Yeah, absolutely. And you, join the board right at a great time, Director Salazar, because we're getting into some, um, setting some of those um, in our results policy. We're reworking it right now to say, you know, what do we want to see and when based on which data for these particular kids. Um, also, lots of other different measures that we look at. And so it, that's where we're doing some of that work and we haven't set those yet. So Perfect timing and and great point by Director Shandagiri and Director Salazar. Okay, we need to move. We need to move on on our red robin. Yeah. Can I say two quick things here? Sorry, I can't get Round to my robin, hand. not red robin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know it's all. Yeah, let's do red robin though. How about that? Um, I think we'll let Alice tackle that bullet because we've got some inconsistencies of language. And then on, I want to go back to Dr. Uh, Director Shonda Geary's dual language immersion expansion. We really should should just say program because immersion is only one part of the program. There's cross cultural competencies, you know, the three pillars. So um, I, I think it needs to be program. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. We have not heard a second time yet from Director Avila, I don't think. It's a wonderful document. Let's move forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I haven't had a chance yet. I do have one kind of more substantive suggestion. Um, <clears throat> we talk about placing top priority on student well-being um, up Let's see, what is it, that third bullet after the and who? And so my suggestion would be that we would have one bullet that says places top priority on student, staff, and educator well-being. And that would be a standalone bullet. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next one would be 
places the student at the center, like no substantive changes in that, but, and I don't know if we want to use the word places again, we could come up with a different action word there, but I do want to call out <laughs> the importance of the superintendent focusing on the well-being of student staff and educators. Director Hyen. Oh, just clarification questions. Educators are staff, so isn't that redundant? And shouldn't it just be students and staff? Every every staff member is important, from bus drivers to the people in the lunchroom to our teachers and our IAs. Yeah, I, I agree. They are all staff. Um, I call out educator in particular. I think for a similar reason that you call out parents. Um, because, you know, our teachers and support professional, everybody um, that educates is important. An educator is a, a further describing word of staff. If there's, we also have like two different unions representing our teachers versus all of the people that support our, our schools. So if there's a better word to describe I'm open to that. I do really want to call out educators, though. Chair. Sure. Director Shandragiri. Would you consider a friendly change, not just calling out staff and educator well-being, but creating a culture that empowers staff and educators and all those who serve in our district so everybody brings the best? So how would you, so um, like creates a culture? Of... Mm -hmm. Creates a culture of staff and educator empowerment and well, well-being or something like that. No, the students yeah, is absolutely. a different thing, but the staff and educators have to feel empowered. So they feel safe to speak and share their ideas. And that way we can improve their well-being. Now. Because that way we bring the best out of our teachers and staff and they come up with their best ideas and they feel safe and empowered. They're all like, I mean, so much to offer. Empowered. I like that a lot, Director Chandra Gary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe we should call out specifically mm -hmm. um, instead of just, I don't know that staff I mean, is descriptive okay. enough. Maybe we could say um, education support professionals and educators. That I leave it to you to decide. But the idea is everybody feeling empowered to exactly bring the creative best, and and that way we create a beautiful program with five thousand empowered people contributing the best for our children. So it creates a culture of support. It creates a culture which. Uh, creating a creates a culture where you know okay there's staff feel that. empowered and well-being i'm kind of getting lost in the wording mm -hmm. and <laughs> wordings to you creates a culture where education support professionals educators and students are empowered all right that works for me I know I really like the word well-being though. We could get that in there somehow. <laughs> no, no, that will create well-being. That's a product. True. Can't you just say places priority on their well-being? That's where yep. I was headed. Yeah, perfect. See what we can do when we wordsmith together. <laughs> well, don't trust my English. You're doing awesome. You've come up with lots of good suggestions. Try not to laugh too hard. I've got Ritz crackers in my teeth right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is that okay with everyone as it reads now? So creates a culture where all staff, including education, support professionals, educators, or... Um, and students, wait, I don't know. I'm getting lost now. Crazy culture. 
think I think it's close enough for Alice. Okay, perfect. And then yeah. the, having the second bullet be prioritizes the student at the center of decision making. Um, so that doesn't really change that one too drastically. All right, I don't think I have any other additional suggested feedback. Um, so that would conclude round robin unless I forgot anyone. Um, Student Advisor McDonald, unless if there's anything you wanted to add, I want to give you no, the opportunity. This, this looks great. This looks great. Okay, great. And we did have our Student Advisor Brennan also weighed in um, in writing to let us know that um, Z was fine with this, uh, the, the previous version. Hopefully Z will also like this one. All right. Okay, with that, um, the plan would be then to take a break for about 10 to 15 minutes so that Alice can work her magic. And then we would come back and hopefully be able to take a motion and move this forward. So we will take a break. It is 7.58. Let's just come back at um, 8.15, please. Thank you.
All right, let's um, reconvene. And I think that Alice was able to make her work her magic on um, the remaining changes that need to be made. And hopefully superintendent will be able, Sur Superintendent Perry can pull it up again. And then um, we will move to number five, which is to take action on this item to approve the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools ideal profile for the next superintendent. Um, if Alice, can you zoom out so we can see the document in total? Well, oh, and then folks yeah. should be able to zoom in if if Alice has the full document shown, then you should be able to zoom in on Zoom to see the pieces that you want to see. Does that work? Yeah, and there were a couple things that she needed to rearrange. So um, I would like you to look carefully um, at it to be sure that you're happy with. I'm going to get the um, track changes screen off too, just so it's a little easier to clear. And and if you cut if you cut or minimize the font in that opening paragraph, that might be useful. Mm. Let's see. What's everyone's preference? Do you want to have Alice zoom in and we can all take some time to read it? while she slowly scrolls through, or do you want to take care of zooming on Zoom in on the pieces? Uh, if you leave it right where it is right now, I, I can read it without my readers on, so I would be good if everybody else is. Okay. And Christy has it on Zoom. I'm working in the background. Okay. Wow, you are good, Alice. <laughs> I thought the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. Alice and I have done this so long together. I write, yeah. she edits mm -hmm. on the other side. Happy to help. It's a great partnership. Okay, is everyone done reading? Um, let me know if you need more time. I see Director Hine has a question. Just wanna make sure everyone's done reading before she asks her question or comment. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone speak. Okay, Director Hine. I just have a word swap, if it makes sense to everybody else. Uh, on the um, the first bullet after and who, instead of which values and includes, to me, it, I like better which includes and values. And I don't know what other people's opinions are. You know, maybe I'm just being weird here. I'm not sure. I'm fine with that either way. Director Guzman Ortiz. I'm tired of wordsmithing and <laughs> um, on that. First, and who I 
notice we have stakeholders. I thought we had replaced that and I was hoping yeah. that we could. Um, I know that there's been discussions around the word use and just kind of um Yeah, I think we had a version control issue maybe. So okay. um, I think I had replaced it with community. Yes. So that was one. And then on the oh, I lost it. Um but the third bullet from there fosters culture where all students and all staff i guess it just felt a little redundant to say all students and all staff and wondering if we could just say where students and staff including um but it's just kind of a, a i guess as i was reading the flow of it felt somewhat redundant yeah i'm i'm fine with those changes if everyone else is all right other comments okay then i would accept a motion my motion that we both pass this new superintendent criteria I feel like we we have to have a specific motion if I'm remembering. I'm looking. Um, yes, Alice, you had I. It's I don't see <laughs> yes. it in my agenda though. It's okay. It's actually under on the um, the action item itself. You need to move to approve the Salem Kaiser Public Schools ideal profile for next superintendent. So the title of it. Okay, so Director Avila. I second it. Moves to approve the Salem Kaiser Public Schools ideal profile for the next <laughs> superintendent. And I second it. Director Shondra Gary seconds the motion. And is there any further discussion before we vote? All right. Hearing none. Um, all those in favor? Say aye and raise your hand. So, aye. 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 Okay, do we have everyone? It's hard to, I can't see my whole screen. I think I saw all directors say aye and their hand raised. So the outcome is a unanimous approval of the ideal profile for the next superintendent. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful news. Thank you so much for working through this process and to the community for weighing in. This is so important um, that we get the right pool of candidates and are able to select an amazing superintendent. Um, I will now um, turn it over to, our, to Hank Harris again for the next part of our meeting, which is a discussion on the compensation for the next superintendent. And so take it away, Hank. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, but I also, I have to just say, board, that was um, that was a, a really great conversation. And sometimes wordsmithing can get tedious. And maybe at times it maybe it felt a little bit. But I have to say that was um, really exceptional work um, and engaged. And uh, I'm just really pleased with, um, you know, sometimes I think people think that I want to come in with an ideal profile and I want you to accept it as is. And I really don't. Like, I want you to own it. And um, and you're owning this, and this I think is a much better document that we started the night with. So thank you for for making it what it is, and um, congrats. And so we are we're going to talk about compensation in a moment. I want to um, just add, if I can, one or two quick pieces. We are moving after tonight. Now now with this document that you just approved, we are ready to open your vacancy window, which is uh, coming up next week. It's um, December fifth. And so uh, Kathleen and I will go quite, you won't hear a lot from us over Christmas break or winter break, I'm sorry, um, which is just as well. We'll be actively recruiting um, candidates, working with them, discussing how great Salem Kaiser is. And uh, you won't see us again until January. I wanna remind you of two agreements that you made when we started this. And Director Salazar, you weren't here for that, so you're hearing it for the first time. Um, there will be, um, there will likely be candidates who might reach out to you directly. Um, they might want to ask you questions. They might want to go out for coffee with you. 
Um, and while that's gracious of them to do that, that's not something that we want to do as board members. And we talked about this way back when we started, because if you have coffee with one person, it kind of means you have to have coffee with everybody. And that's not how, how we want to operate. So if a candidate reaches out to you at any point in the process and says, hey, I know you're on the board, I'm interested in the job, please thank them and refer them to Kathleen and or myself. Um, our emails are prominent. You can give them our email address. You can just go to the Salem Kaiser web. It's not hard for them to find us. Um, so please remember to do that. Do not engage in conversations with candidates. And um, you will also almost certainly be approached by people who are not candidates, but want you to know that their friend, colleague, or somebody they think is amazing is applying and similar rules apply. So if they say, hey, I just want to tell you about this great candidate who's applying from wherever, just direct that person to us. Do not get into those conversations for the same reason, right? It gives somebody a leg up, whereas it doesn't give other people a leg up. Um, and if there is a candidate that you would like Kathleen and myself to reach out to, you, you can tell us that. You can say, hey, I've heard there's a great candidate in District X, would you look into it? You can do that, and you can do that just by emailing us directly. We're not going to say anything other than, okay, thank you, but we will we will look into that. And that would be true for any board director, but it would be true for really any anybody. And that's how we do this work is through not only our network, but through the networks of others. So any questions on what I just said? Okay, fabulous, wonderful. Thank you, board. Let's, uh, let's go to what I think is the last agenda item of the night, which is the compensation for the next superintendent. Um, so, are we able to, we can probably only pull up one document at a time, right? It's probably the best we can do. So let's pull up, um, bear with me one moment, please. It's addendum. I'd like to start with the addendums. Um, can we open addendum A, please? So this would, would say contract analysis at the top in a big black box. Oh, oh, great. Thank you, Alice. I knew, I knew that. I'm sorry. They're all on one PDF because you magically put them all together. Yeah, I've um, got it. So thank you. This is great. So the order that we'll do, and since you're doing the page turning, uh, Superintendent Paris, we'll start with the A, then we'll go to B, and then we'll go back to the cover letter at the end. Okay, um, and if we could zoom in just a little bit more, because it's the top half of the page is probably, that's so that we can see up through a little farther out. I want to see the top, and I also want to see the gray bands. So can you zoom back at that? That that looks good. Directors, hopefully you can see that. So I first want to walk through the data um, and just make sure it all makes sense. And so we'll start with me explaining the data and asking for any sort of clarification questions that we'll do that with the first two slides. And then on the third slide where you see a recommendation, then we'll have more of a conversation about what you think about it. But to, in order to think about it, we got to understand what the data is saying. Um, so let me walk through this. And some of you are more and some of you are maybe less familiar with how salaries work. In Oregon, I think you all have some degree of understanding, but I don't want to leave anybody out. So um, what you are looking at here is the is what is happening in what's happening in the market. And we're going to define the market in this slide as the nine the, the nine other largest. It's the top 10 districts in this in the state in terms of superintendent salary, removing Salem Kaiser from that. So from one to ten in rank order, you'll see the uh, you'll see the districts that are the comparator districts and their student population. Uh, I believe that's last year's student population data. Uh, so that might be slightly different, but in general, um, in general, it's, it's it's workable for our purposes today. Um, okay, so when we compare those nine districts against each other. And this part, you probably all know, but I'll just say that for the good of the order, in Oregon, we have three large school districts that all are kind of around the same size and have been for many years, which is Portland, Beaverton, and Salem. And then there's a steep drop as we get to number four through 10 and even further down, and you see that. So Portland, Salem, Salem's size is not on this list, but you know what that is. So Portland, Beaverton, Salem are all kind of, Salem-Kaiser are all in that high 
level and then drops down precipitously when we get to number four. So those are the comparators. Let's go to those gray bars. Hank, um, Director yeah. Hyen has her hand up. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Director uh, Thank you. Uh, what is district paid TSA? Yeah, let me, I'm gonna get there in just two seconds. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. So when we get to those bars, uh, you can see that there are um, there are the th there are three bars which are the lowest. Of, so I mean, to state perhaps the obvious, the lowest comparison is whichever of those ten falls lowest in terms of salary, uh, the highest, and the average of the comparators. And then you're looking at it against the current uh, compensation package for the Salem Kaiser superintendent. And so let's, uh, as, as Director Hyman just asked, let's sort of walk across what that looks like. Um, the PERS adjusted salary, you, you may very well know that uh, in some districts, the employee pays their, in most districts, I think the employee pays their own. Um, I'm not sure that's true anymore, so forget that I just said that. But in some districts, the employee pays their own 6.5%, and in other districts, the employer pays that 6.5%. So in order to make sure when we compare Oregon salaries, uh, we always we have that PERS adjusted salary where a district that is paying it and a district that isn't paying it, we can look at numbers that are apples to apples. And so that's where you see the PERS adjustment. Um, and you'll see that in Salem-Kaiser because the employee pays her own um, I'm not going to say that because I think I, I think I'm going to say the wrong thing. But at any rate, we're adjusting for PERS. Um, then you're seeing across the board there are some other uh, there are some other items that often find themselves in superintendent contracts. The district uh, paid TSA is the tax sheltered annuity. It's a contribution to insurance plans, retirement insurance above and beyond PERS, and it's very standard uh, for a school board to um, add a TSA package for superintendents. Uh, particularly in, in districts of size. So certainly if you look at other districts um, that have 39, 40,000, but even districts 15, 20,000 often uh, will have a contribution toward the TSA, toward the tax shelter and annuity. And then you're seeing a couple other comp pieces, um, tech, and in that column, other comp is a catch-all. And sometimes those are quite large and sometimes those are quite small. Um, one of the places where you see sometimes a, a large compensation piece is, and you have to look at each contract, so that's why it's a catch-all, but sometimes folks have uh, longevity um, payments. So if you stick around for three years or five years, the board will give a certain amount of additional compensation. Uh, there's various things that can fall into that. There's also the total, so the, the next column is the total compensation. That's salary plus all those other pieces um, that figure into total compensation. So you're seeing that in the second to last column. And, um, and then in the very last column, total compensation with vacation. So you may or may not know that in many superintendent contracts, there is um, the right to purchase back vacation days, meaning that a contract would, of course, afford a superintendent X number of vacation days because of the very, very busy and intense nature of the work of the superintendency. It's not uncommon for a superintendent to not take all of his or her, her vacation days. And in many contracts, there is the opportunity then if I don't take five days or seven days because I'm working through them, can I get paid for those five or seven days that I'm working? Um, and in many superintendent contracts, there is the opportunity. Usually there's a capped amount of vacation days. So, okay, as part of your contract each year, you can cash out whatever, five, seven, 10, 12 vacation days, whatever are the specifics. And because there is a, uh, a value, a, a dollar value associated with that, that's where you see um, the difference between those two last columns. So I want to pause and, make, and answer any questions about clarification. I want to make sure this data makes sense to you. Uh, I would say the key numbers you're looking at are column, the salary column and the comp, the total comp and total comp with vacation columns. Are there any questions or clarifications I can offer? I'm not necessarily going to see hand, so. D Director Chandra Gary. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, this is for what year salary range is it? Uh, is this the older one or is it the current one? Because uh, so, uh, you mean, do you mean to be competitive year? and get a good superintendent, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Director Tony Gary, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is it what what is the what is the year from which yeah. these contracts are drawn? It's the current it's the current year. It's 2022, 20, 2023. Has it been adjusted for the current uh, market rate nationally or within the state? Or is it an old data? That's what I was not clear. So right, what we're looking at, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question, is is a comparison of current year superintendent contracts from these 10 districts. Okay. Was, did I answer that? Did I answer your question? You did. Okay. And can I ask you just a follow-up question? Sure. Now, if we were to compare this with, say, the nationally or Pacific Northwest for a similar size district, how does it compare? How do yeah. you compare to others? I am going to speak to that. If you would, if you would let, if you would, not mind if we waited until we got to that third page and I can speak to sort of regional numbers. Thank you so much, Director Shundagir. Are there any other hands up? Okay. Let's go if we can to addendum B. So this is a very similar document um, but it's looking only at the top four, really it's the top three, because Salem is one of the top, Salem Kaiser is one of the top four. So it's looking at our three closest comparators. Recognize, if you will, that two of the comparators, Portland and Beaverton, are much closer in size uh, and scope of work than the fourth district. And so this, uh, this gives you a little bit of a sort of a zooming in on, on the closest market comparators which are these three districts. Now I want you to notice, although it, this, this, this document intentionally does not state which district has which um, salary, you might be able to intuit which district is the lowest comparator. And you can certainly see Salem's and you, you probably could wager a guess of what the highest comparison district is. Any questions on this? Okay. I'm, I'm assuming there's no hands raised. Okay, so let's go if we can to the first slide, which is our recommendation, uh, and you're going to see that in the bottom. And while you're looking at that number, I want to I want to say what I what I think and hope I said when we talk about the ideal profile, which is our job as consultants is to bring you our best thinking um, of what you need to do to make effective decisions. And we did that with the ideal profile. We said this is what we think is best, and then you in your wisdom do as you will. And so similar, I wanna take a similar approach to the compensation. Um, we recommend this, uh, these goalposts um, as your general compensation. But when you think about what you might pay your next superintendent, um, I'm gonna use this word goalposts a few times in my, in my talking points. Uh, this is what we recommend. Um, if we are mindful board that your pocketbooks, your and the money that you steward is your responsibility. And all we can do is give you our best thinking. So tonight, what we'd like to do is have you engage in a conversation uh, with each other as much as with us about, about these numbers and about what you feel comfortable paying your next superintendent. Now, our outcome tonight at the end of the night is not to take action on any dollar figure. We're not doing that tonight. What we're doing tonight, rather, is you in your conversation are going to illuminate for Kathleen and myself where you each stand as board members on this. You're not actually going to approve a dollar figure for your next superintendent until the end of this process, when hopefully you land on an individual that you think is fabulous and there is a process uh, 
which we'll talk about at a later point, where you actually create that contract. That's not what you're doing tonight. Tonight, you're engaging in a conversation with each other about what do we think? What are we comfortable with? Um, we want to be prudent and we want to be good financial stewards. And we also want to make sure we attract great folks and pay them commensurate to what superintendents ought to be making and treat them fairly. And all of those things that you think about when you think about something as essential as what are we paying someone? Um, so with that said, I would like to um, ask you to converse with each other and or to ask us questions about um, what you see here and just take a little time to converse about it. When we when that conversation wraps up, I'm going to ask if each board member, because we're not taking action as a group tonight, at the end of our conversation, I'm gonna ask each board member to share their thoughts, their individual thoughts on where their comfort level is with respect to, um, to salary and compensation. Uh, I might ask the chair if you'll be willing to call on people because mm -hmm. I, I don't see hands. I only see one person at a time. Okay. Um, yeah, no problem. You don't mind doing that. Um, Director Chandra Geary. Hank, I'm going to go back to the question I asked. No. Yeah, thank you. Because to come up with that kind of uh, how do we stand, do we kind yeah. of do it locally within our Salem, Oregon, or do we think in terms of nationally yeah. or do we think regionally? So to Thank you, thank you for asking that the second time, and I, I apologize that I didn't speak to it just now. So now I will speak to it. So Oregon is uh, is not a top paying uh, state in general when it comes to superintendents. And we are on both sides of us, to the north in Washington, to the south in California. We are really behind them, noticeably behind them. So it is as, as recruiters who do a lot of our work, we primarily work in Oregon and Washington, and Oregon is where our heart is. And I can tell you from experience, it is very difficult to attract um, superintendents of like size districts from California or Washington to come to Oregon. It might not be so hard to uh, attract a superintendent of a small Washington or a small California district in terms of salary to a large Oregon district. But in terms of what is a a Salem Kaiser size district in Oregon pay versus one in California versus one in Washington, considerably less. Um, so when we think about, you know, our closest maybe like districts would probably be up in Clark County, Washington, in Vancouver and Evergreen, which are both sizable districts. Uh, they are, they are in terms of, um, they are above this. Uh, last time I checked in the high 300s, um, in terms of salary, and I can double check that, um, and total comp in the low four for sure. Um, but if you look across Washington state, you see a lot of school superintendents paid in the 330 to 360 range in districts that are not as large or as, or as complex as Salem-Kaiser and true as well in California. California is a bit more regional. So if you're in the Bay area, you're in the LA area, you're gonna see some really high salaries. If you're, if you're not, um, Del Norte County, which is, you know, if you know where that is, that's the far northwest part of the state of California, but it's a really small district too. So you're seeing a challenge for us to be attractive to those kind of states. Now, there are other states that are commensurate with Oregon or that pay less than Oregon. So um, Idaho, uh, Alaska, uh, Wyoming um, are states that typically pay less. Colorado is a state that's kind of on par. And so um, you do see superintendents come from California, Colorado and come to Oregon. Um, that seems to happen. Uh, and then as you move farther east, you have really a, a diversity of kind of pay. It's, it's um, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts higher, some of the Southern states lower, and it's not always exactly like that, but that's kind of what we're looking at when we're trying to attract candidates to Oregon. I'm muted, Director Hyen. Thank you. I guess I would hope that, you know, that a potential candidate would look at the entire picture. Certainly New York and the cost of living there, you know, what is 50,000 a year? Is it like minimum wage in New York? I mean, it's just a lot different. And even California, I think is a lot different. Um, 
I'm not sure about uh, Washington State. Oregon's not cheap, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, just some of the different districts, uh, the, it, it's not really comparable just because of the cost of living and, and everything and currently no sales tax, sort of, except for the cat tax. Uh, and then um, also I would hope that we could sell some of the things about Oregon. You know, these people aren't from Oregon. I mean, we got, you know, an hour, 90 minutes to the, to the ocean and the, you know, and the same thing to, to the snow, to the mountains and skiing. We have so much to offer for anybody who loves the outdoors that, you know, hopefully we can attract somebody with more than, just a number, but kind of the whole package. I find the 425 kind of shocking um, because I know PERS is forever. <laughs> and, you know, that's, it's going to get pretty expensive. And I'm concerned about an economic downturn. And, you know, we're, we've already got people struggling as employees, you know, with, you know, the inflation and everything. It just, it's just a little scary for me. Thank you. We don't want them skiing and going to the beach. Or <laughs> we want them working. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, they can have five days to do that, right? <laughs> I'm just they don't kidding. have to buy it back. You no, know, I, I would, I would, I would echo what uh, she had to say because uh, when we were recruiting teachers and we go into these, go into California, especially, especially our bilingual teachers, is quality of life in Oregon is what we emphasized, and we did pull some people out of that just with that. I think, you know, some administrators might have that same thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say, and oh, I, go ahead, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just, and it's not my, it's really not my place to argue. So I don't want to argue, but I, I do want to share as somebody who moved from the East coast to Oregon and loves Oregon more than any other place. I, I always thought I could I could just sell people on how great we are in Oregon. And I think there is some, I mean, that's what we do as recruiters. I mean, we're out there selling how great it is. Um, and at the same time, when people start saying I have to take a 30 or $40,000 pay cut, you know, and they're not, they're not dumb. They're going to look at housing prices and maybe housing prices offset that a little bit, but it is still kind of a tough swallow for a lot of folks. Maybe a $5,000 pay cut, not so much, but a 30, 40, in my experience is um so i'll just put that out there and then now i'll be quiet i'm just gonna say and then you have to tell them about seasonal depression <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not in the marketing for sure <laughs> you can buy them a lamp they make special lamps for that <laughs> we'll include that in the compensation package yeah, yeah. The lamp. yeah we'll put it in a special category <laughs> director chandra gary well, I'm not going to talk about LAMP today because it'll be a medical advice. So <laughs> I don't want somebody to come. Now, I am going to think differently. I'm not going to agree on the dollar rest like today is not the day. But I really think we should aim at a higher level because I've seen our Superintendent Perry work. This is a very complex district. Just because you summarize 13,000, uh, sorry, 1,300 interviews, there's a lot of work needs to be done. And we really want to jumpstart and get our district to a very good position to be at a national level. So I'm really thinking, how do we make it attractive? I mean, ski resort and all is great. Please include all that in the budget. You can even include vineyards of the Yam, Salem, Yam Hill, Willamette Vineyard. All that is fine. But at the end of the day, we want somebody, you know, we want to attract excellent candidates, preferably someone coming from outside and thinking outside the box and jumping start. This is an investment on our children. That's how I see. And we have 39,000 kids. I mean, superintendent is like the gatekeeper for education for our children. We come with that hope to this country. So we want the best uh, to be the gatekeeper who can think innovative, think of global perspective and cutting edge and get our uh, district to grow. Uh, I mean, it's fine. We can essentially poach from a smaller district in Oregon and bring them here or do all those things. That's like raw Peter Paypal. 
But the reality is we really want to jumpstart. And for that, we have to respect their contribution, the amount of work they need to do and the challenge we are talking about uh, things. So I really think we need to compensate well, like we need to really compensate our teachers well and the staff well. But at least we have only one employee and we really want to get ourselves at a global stage or a national stage. So if it takes being one of the highest in the state of Oregon to attract somebody along with a wine bottle or ski resort or a sad lamp, seasonal affected disorder lamp, whatever it takes. But that's how I see there's a lot of work. There's a lot of challenges. And I don't want it, us to be very naive in selling it and then say, we wish we had not got. We really want to infuse something. So to me, I don't see this salary as competitive enough to attract from a national level. So what would it take for us to be at least attractive from a national level is what I would ask our board to consider, please. This is one time, one opportunity we have to take us there. So dollar amount, I don't know the answer. So, but at least start thinking that way. Um, Director Salazar. Where did our current superintendent come from? 20 miles down the road? Yes. I she's... think we have competent mm -hmm. people in the state of Oregon that could meet that need. If we have to go national and somebody wants to come in at the rate that we're paying, we would maybe make it a little more, uh, you know, uh, valid for them. But I think uh, there are good people in Oregon or maybe even the Northwest that would uh, would uh, be uh, sensitized to come to uh, Salem-Kaiser without us having to uh, give, a, give it a, a price. I think, yes, I think we go with the highest prices that I see here for total compensation, but I don't see us exceeding that for someone that uh, would come from the East Coast or from the South or South California, because I think that the people that do, that are here are, are some good people too, that we could find with, within the state or the Northwest. Thank you. Student Advisor McDonald. Yeah, this is kind of uh, both a comment and a question, but just thinking about how maybe the best superintendent for our district might also be the best superintendent for another district. And so if we are competing um, to really think about making sure we have a competitive um, salary and because I mean, the, the 20, 30, $40,000 that we might choose to get the best superintendent might, out there might bring us a superintendent who's not going to make decisions that might end up losing our district money or wasting our district's money. So um, this is a really important investment. And then also kind of a question I have for Hank, and I don't know how, if you are privy to this information or if you can share it, but do we know if there are other superintendent, superintendent searches or higher profile superintendent searches for bigger districts going on? in the Northwest and the nation that, that we might be actively competing for, or is that we do we not know? Yeah. So, um, so the, we are, we are toward the front end of superintendent searches for the current year. Um, and when I say toward the front end, you're starting to see searches open in the next few weeks. And we're kind of, we're ready to go next week. So we're not like miles ahead, but we're at the front end. And the reason I say that is when we get to the point, when you get to the point that you're going to be selecting and appointing, you're still gonna be a little bit at the front end, but there are other districts out there that um, that are looking. Um, and some will be, some will, some are actually, there are a few that are, a small few that are actually already in hiring. Um, the biggest district in Minnesota is at their, which uh, is, a, is a district you might not have heard of called Anoka Hennepin, if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's the area around Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they've, they've just announced their finalists. Um, Bellevue, Washington in the North uh, just went to semifinals. Those are the super early districts. 
um, you're in the kind of the early districts and you're kind of toward the front end of the early. But I think that's a really good point too. When you, we get to um, that period of time where you have your final interviews and you're ready to move forward, it is not uncommon for some of those candidates to be in more than one search and particularly if they're of great talent. Um, so, but their, their choice about whether to even put their name in the hat or not will somewhat be informed by the style. I don't wanna, I don't wanna presume nor do we want to appeal to candidates who are only looking at the dollar figure, right? That's not who we're looking for. But a person of great talent who sees, who's looking at a few different districts and some pay considerably less and some pay considerably more, you know, humans as humans are, probably will be more attracted to the ones that are on the higher side of things. I don't, did I fully answer your question? Um, mm -hmm. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of districts that are right now beginning their search process. Um, across the country, and I certainly don't know all of them, but this is the time of the year when that starts to happen. Yeah, that, you did a good job, thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick time check here. We're at 8.57. Um, we need to wrap up very soon for interpreting um, simultaneous interpreters. Um, so let's go to Director Avila. Uh, thank you. Um, Hank, is there any information and consideration that we should be looking at in terms of budget in, in comparison to these other comparable size districts um you know because I'm, I'm, I'm considering really quickly you know los angeles unified school district which their new superintendent is getting paid four hundred forty thousand dollars. with he has five hundred and twenty two thousand more kids their students and a budget uh, it's also 11 11 point billion or 11 billion more a bigger of a budget so a difference of minimum 100,000 to 140,000 that we would be willing to offer for th these large differences. I know we want to pay a superintendent, everybody a little bit more, but I wanted to take in consideration the budget of these comparable size districts as well. I, I, you know, that's a fair, it's, it's a fair point. It's a fair point to look at. I'm not familiar with, with the LAUSD soup sal salary, but it sounds like you are. And it's, it's a fair point to say that. And so that I would say, think about that. But then I would also say this, if you were to accept this recommendation at 300 to 340 salary, and if this person came in, let's just say they came in at the top at 340, they would still be the third highest paid superintendent in Oregon. So that's another way to think about it too, right? I mean, that's, and both of those are, are fair frame of references for you to be thinking through as you think about how you want to land on this. Yeah, thank you. Director Guzman Ortiz. I just wanted to throw my pitch since I know Hank said he wanted to hear from us all. So um, for this one, I I know that there's been kind of dialogue around attracting candidates from outside of the state. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again about my strong preference for someone who is a resident of Oregon who has like strong leadership background also within our state. Um, I do kind of just, I guess, in, in mind thinking if these are numbers from the 2020 one twenty two numbers considering inflation, like increase in housing, you know, market prices and all of that. So um, just kind of wanted to name it because those are the numbers that we're looking at. And those are perhaps comparably what we're comparing with. Um, but just recognizing that there has kind of been an influx um, and a growth there. And then we mentioned um, when I was here on vacation, I guess I'm just going to make my initial pitch to writing in requiring vacation days into our contract, wanting to model um, leaders to be, you know, take care of themselves and that will be, I know we wrote that into um, our ideal uh, candidate description earlier. So just wanted to call that out. And the fourth largest district on this list, at least I, if I'm not mistaken, is opening up a superintendent search as well. So like that one just popped up to me because, you know, they're pretty high up there. <laughs> so I, just to um, our student advisor's comments about the competitiveness and who else is kind of looking for Awesome candidates. You're spot on. Thank you for, for mentioning that district. And the other thing I want to mention, if I can just quickly say, and because you were talking about the years, and I think that's really important that we look at this. We're looking at current year contracts, so 22, 23, which were written at, in the spring or sooner. And although you're looking at 22, 23 contracts, you're going to write a contract for 2023, 20, 24. So if that makes sense, 
by the time you hire your new superintendent, this data is kind of obsolete because we're, we're already in a new school year. So factor that in as well. So thank you for, for raising that. Director Chandra Carey. Well, there's also been, uh, you know, I was attending the workshop Superintendent Perry and Dr. Sproles gave. I, if I remember the numbers, maybe Christy can help us. There's like 70, 80% of the superintendent turnover. So there's a lot of people moving back and forth and a lot of changes. So uh, how that will factor in, in terms of how do we attract the best is also something I just wanted to throw that open because everybody is looking for a superintendent's position and uh, how can we be competitive, not just by salary, but by other things, you know, there are if yeah, it's not it's better significant better. Board, board dynamic is significant. Mm -hmm. All those things will matter when it comes to attracting. So, yeah. So I have a couple, Paul, I'll come to you. I just want to give my perspective really quick unless. Okay. He seems okay with that. <laughs> um, so Thank you for doing this analysis, um, Hank and Kathleen. Um, just a couple of things. I think we obviously want to recruit someone amazing um, and we want to be competitive. <clears throat> it does seem um, like the numbers are shocking, um, I think, to all of us. Um, I, having the state worker experience and understanding the compensation for state government living in Salem. It, I am, it, you know, thinking about things like what the salaries are for the heads of the major agencies like DHS, OHA, ODOT, um, like the highest paid executives in Salem. And those ranges are usually anywhere from like starting 160 to 280 at year 10 or 11 and so it is hard for me a little bit to digest not because i don't want to pay someone this but because we're hearing so much about a potential recession um you know we're thinking about the state school fund and the budget in total and how much strain and all the things we need to fund and so you know, i do think we have to make difficult choices and you know i would love to pay people definitely what they're worth and beyond. But I, I do just, I am just genuinely curious about like, how did we get to a point where all superintendents are making this amount? Not because I don't think they deserve it, but when I look at what state agency um, comparators are, it's pretty dramatically different for what I would consider much larger budgets, more employees. Um, it's a different world, but it just it's just shocking to me. Um, and so I have to raise that. I would love to see the range go slightly below what our current superintendent makes. Um, that's just one of those things that really bothers me when someone's worked in the position for a decade and then we're starting the next person higher than that person. <laughs> But to, I mean, just like not even thinking about starting them lower. So I would just love to see it bump down to like maybe 280 up to 340 um, and the adjustment on the total compensation. But obviously all this will be a negotiation. And again, I don't want to convey that I don't think any of these amazing people aren't worth that amount. It's just thinking big picture, state budget, state school fund, all of those things. Um, Mr. Dacopoulos. Thank you. Just a couple of points, and I really appreciate the conversation. Having been involved in um, all of the superintendent contracts, um, or at least the last five uh, for this district, um, it's notable that every time we have had a national surge, uh, we've had um, candidates that the board's that, that our board has been interested in that have their hat in the ring with at least one other district and sometimes two. So I think you should go into this expecting that if you haven't, if you're going to do a national search, uh, these are people that are going to be looking 
uh, and other districts as well. And that's that's certainly been the case for Salem Kaiser. Um, and so just just take that for what it's worth. That will happen next. I think uh, because I work with other school districts as well, and including some on this list. Uh, I think the 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 market for superintendents is tighter now because it's the harder job than it was three years ago. It just is. Um, you ask any superintendent, um, is this the hardest time in your whole career? And they'd all say yes. And so the the market forces will, um, will recognize that. Um, so that's my two cents. Thank you for that, Paul. Hank, do you have final questions for us? Or yeah, I, I do. I do, and I know there's an interest in in um, bringing the meeting to um, fruition. So I here's what I'd like to do, and um, and Chair Carson Cottingham, maybe you can tell me if you think this will work now, or if we should do something at our next board meeting. But what I would here's what I would ask, and, and tell me if you think the board is ready to do this and has time to do this. I would like to hear from each board member. Um, just very succinctly and briefly, like maybe even less than a sentence of what what they are comfortable in, in numerically with either salary or total comp or both to give Kathleen and I some goalposts so that we can begin conversations with um, with candidates as early as next week. If we feel that we could do that right now, I would love that. If we feel that we can't do that, we want to think about it a little bit, and come back to it at your next board meeting as a very short agenda item. I think we could do that too. What we're looking for really is just some talking points so that we know what we can and can't say when we enter conversations with candidates about, about the comp piece. Dr. Hyen. Uh, thank you. Uh, so one thing that would probably help me is to get a refresher on uh, Superintendent Perry's uh, current salary and her current total compensation package and, and the different pieces of it. Just just to look at that to start would, would help me. That's right in the, that was what he pulled up. That oh, was that? Yeah, so on addendum. So we can pull it back up again so I can see it again. That would help. Yeah, right. Right, the okay. District 2 Salem Kaiser Gray Bar under so the 99080 is the current salary. And then total comp is 365,795. Okay. All right. So. I, I kind of agree with you, uh, Chair Carson and Cottingham, that you know, starting at least the starting number lower than the current superintendent, that does not necessarily mean that's what we hire them at. It depends on experience and everything else, right? But to, to start that range lower so it can be somewhere in there. Um, Director Chandra Gary. I, I would say to be competitive and considering everything else, the cost of housing in Salem, et cetera, uh, and the complexity of what we are facing, 400,000 uh, total comp is a good starting number uh, to make ourselves comparable, competitive. I mean, ideally we should go for the highest number, but that would be my stay since the next board meeting i won't be here in the country so i just want to throw that number at me. so director chandra gary do you mean the top of the total comp the yeah, total compensation lower it to 400 or keep it at 425 for them going out well the top of the compensation it says 425000 mm -hmm. anywhere from 400000 onwards we can start looking for depending on the experience uh, because we really have to factor in the cost of housing there's hardly any i mean housing in this time purchasing a home moving to this place and then for us to be competitive if they are looking elsewhere that's that's helpful for me that, that okay thank you yeah director high do you have recommendations on the numbers well, I have just an additional comment, and I know when we were talking about different races for Superintendent Perry over the years, you know, sometimes it's advantageous to do more of the deferred comp, you know, instead of the bigger salary increase mm -hmm. because PERS is forever. And I think that that is my biggest concern 
-hmm. And so if we can have the salary maybe a little lower and do the benefits that we don't pay PERS on forever higher to, to get to a total compensation that, that is competitive would be good. When they start here, will they be tier three purse or they will move their purse from somewhere else? I'm not sure about that. Tier 103, I think, but. <laughs> it would depend who it is. We have to get the, the consensus, or I mean the input from other directors, Director Guzman Ortiz. Uh, yes, I'm a little bit of on the fence, but perhaps comfortable with the high end of the total compensation being a 400 um, on that higher end and kind of open, you know, flexible on the beginning salary piece. I know, uh, Chair, you mentioned kind of like that 280. Um, I, I'm comfortable with the 300, but I think just when we're looking at total compensation, even if it was just 25,000 25, plus, like capping it at that 400 range, especially when we're looking at the top four districts sheet, um, all but one, and that is probably like the largest district or under that threshold. Great, thank you. Kathleen? I just wanted to share an observation, and that is it seems like um, I've been seeing, and Hank, you can you can agree or disagree, but um, seeing boards that set a broader range maybe than we would have seen in the past. So another thing you might consider is if you want to move the bottom end lower, you could also move the top end higher, and that would allow you a lot of room um, for that negotiation with your new superintendent based on, you know, just what they're bringing um, bringing to the to the table. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, Director Avila. Yeah, this is uh, just to kind of give a broad, uh, I guess, spectrum, I guess I would say probably capping off that high end around the 400,000 of the total compensation. I like the beginning of the salary there. I do hear your point, actually, in, in consideration and but also the the state of we are with public education and superintendents that they have to deal with um, at a you know like they deal with issues that we've never had to deal with and uh, that's also to say board members are dealing with stuff that they've never had to deal with and it's a different story but um, so I think the the range there for me is the salary is fine just but lowering the total compensation down. To about 400. Director Salazar? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, keeping it at 400. And then uh, I agree with Kathleen, you know, if we have a lower beginning salary or introduction, then that would give us more range in which to negotiate with the individuals. And also looking at uh, some other things within the, the compensations that they might find are uh, more negotiable to keep that keep that amount down but uh yeah i i agree also with ashley what you had to say regarding the you know the state budgets the other things that we'll be having to deal with and how much it's going to maybe affect other programs with that and also the other salaries of the other administrators and teachers that we we are uh looking at salaries for and how they are going to view uh, uh, the price of what we would pay for a new superintendent. Okay, thank you. So I think I, I'm, I would like, yeah, between 280 and 350 for salary, I'd be good with. I like the idea of lowering a little and expanding on the top end. Um, and I'm completely fine with the total compensation between those amounts listed in your recommendation. Director Shonda Geary. Yeah, I have a very quick take on that. So if you're going to look for somebody with the multilingual, multicultural perspective and trying to lift that, uh, I really think one way to make it attractive is to pay at a very good rate 
maybe total compensation keep the salary low so they can put it under a different bucket one way or other because to me it sends a very positive message to the community that you are going to start at the highest end with such expectation you want us to shift so that would be one way to make it equitable because a lot of folks with you know if you're multilingual or immigrant and you're also it's really you're simultaneously taking care of so many others in the family so really the carry home may not be the same as somebody else who doesn't have that minority tax burden there's a term i believe that's what goes with it but to make them make it so attractive and welcoming so we can attract somebody say from los angeles or somebody else from new mexico or someone that's the reason i was suggesting we need to pay them plus we are thinking of expanding dual language immersion it's a very important message we'll be sending okay you know, that's the reason i suggested yeah. keeping the higher end to make it attractive okay um did i get everybody okay you have what you need hank i do thank you board thank you very much okay um so i want to remind everyone the next board meeting is a regular um, business meeting it will be on december 13th tuesday um and i will adjourn the meeting it's 9 17 p.m thank you all for the great work tonight yeah, take thank care you. Thank, thank you all bye-bye For more videos and information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.